All right, I think we are live. So uh, let me guys uh, let you uh, let me know, guys, in the uh, comments here if you can hear me and see me okay and everything. Uh, hopefully, we get everyone joining in. I just shared the links and everything. Um, and thanks to Gerald and Robert for already uh, stopping by here and leaving their comments. Uh, so I'll get to the Sonata question in a second. I just first want to mention that um, I'm doing this live stream the same as last month's where uh, I have Super Chat enabled. So those uh, anyone who does a Super Chat, that will take priority. Otherwise, I will try and answer everyone's questions as best as I possibly can. But if you want to make sure if you know it fills up here uh, in this chat and stuff, if I'm not getting to your question or I can't you know get to all of them, then uh, that's an easy way to get my attention and is always appreciated. Uh, I also did this uh, live stream a little bit earlier to hopefully... Uh, help accommodate other people's schedules better you know international fans i know you know it's evening for them so it's a little bit more manageable than the last one which i did in uh, evening time here on the east coast and so hopefully you know we can get some international uh fans there to join us here and uh, so yeah uh, that's about it i know there's a few other people like someone mentioned in the weekly update they're a waiter and so they work evening so hopefully this kind of uh catches everyone we got you know it's early enough for west coast people and everything as well so uh, I see we got some people joining us here. Thanks everyone for joining in. This uh, live stream I'm probably gonna do for about two hours, might be a little bit less, uh, might be a little bit more. We'll have to wait and see, but uh, see how much good conversation we have here. It's always a good time though, so I'm looking forward to it. So we'll just dive right in. And since Robert or Gerald was the first person that asked uh, what I think about the new Hyundai Sonata, um, we'll get to that first. I think uh, the Sonata is a very interesting design. Um, I did a little video walk around of the Sonata, the new one at the New York Auto Show. Uh, uh, and you can go watch that video for all my thoughts. But I think it's really interesting how it has that LED strip that like goes halfway up the hood. It's a very uh, unique design feature. And I actually respect Hyundai for kind of going a little bolder and trying new things instead of just following along with what everyone else is doing. So uh, that's kind of the main thing that stands out to me. I'll hopefully be driving the Sonata here towards the end of this year. We'll have to see. Um, but yeah, so that's... Uh, exciting stuff uh should be interesting competition i'm glad that they're doing a sedan at all but anyway going through the chat here sounds like everyone can hear me okay see me everything's good so that's good i see we got someone from the uk so thanks for joining smile per mile and um uh all right we got ali dar too is asking best years to uh buy for the corvette and i think right now the best deals are c7s those are you know and especially next year when everyone buys a c8 the trade-in values on c7s are going to be so low c7 is going to be the bargain of 2020 i mean if you can't afford 60 i mean probably the c8 is the bargain of the year for next year but if you can't afford 60 grand the bargain of the year is going to be the C7. A used C7 is going to be dirt cheap, and it's a fantastic car. Uh, opinion on the 2016 Silverado High Country Blue 3 asks, um, and uh, I did a review on High Country. I don't know if it was a 2016. I think it might have been a 2017. I don't remember, but um, you can go watch that video for all my thoughts on that. The reviews are where I give most of my opinions, and um, yeah, I think you know they're they're a solid truck. Uh, Two Chang, thank you for the super chat. Just saw that pop up. Um, he said it was either this or watching Mr. Regular. I didn't know Mr. Regular is doing a live stream at the same time. That's uh, hopefully you guys can uh, watch both or something. I don't know, but uh, didn't want to overlap there. I didn't realize he was doing one as well. Um, but he's, I love his channel too. He's hilarious. I've it's been a little while since I've watched one of his videos because I'm so backed up in the summertime. I do so many videos and then I catch up on all the YouTube channels that I want to watch in the winter when things slow down a little bit. So I got a lot of his videos to catch up on. Um, Underground Outlaw says, what's the best road to drive around in Pittsburgh? Um, there's a lot of really good roads. We're actually pretty lucky. Depends on what part of Pittsburgh you want to be in, um, you know, as far as suburbs go. Um, where I live is in the northern part of Pittsburgh, and there's a lot of really good roads. And a few of them actually have the name Rochester, and those are uh, – they're both – they're Two or three roads called Rochester Road. They're both fantastic. Lots of great roads around Swickley area, although some of the speed limits around there are low. Um, but there's lots of good stuff. There's some good roads out by Moon Township um, and like by the airport and all that kind of stuff. So there's lots of good stuff. Um, other questions here. Uh, what do you think about the uh, next Gen Z that's uh, going to be released? Um, so yeah, I, um, I'm curious to see what goes on with the next Gen Z. So um, I actually... Very quickly, Luis, thank you for the uh, the super chat here. Um, he's asking about the C63. I'll get to that in a split second here. But uh, getting back to the other question, um, going back, where was it? I just lost my train of thought. 
The new Z, that's it. So for the new Z, um, I did get a tip uh, from someone who watches the weekly updates that they they know someone who has seen a new Z. And um, I, I'm trying to find a way to say this without um, giving the person away, but I will say that someone saw the new Z and um, as far as it's going, I think it's going to be very predictable. Um, I've heard rumors of using existing engines. Um, I'm not going to get more specific than that, but existing engines, and it's going to use design cues from the past. And that's about as close as I can get to uh, being specific. Because again, I don't want to give away um, my source or anything, but um, I, I'm actually excited if what I heard is true. Uh, I think it's going to be awesome. Anyway, getting to your question, Lewis. Sorry for the wait. He says, uh, would the Mercedes C63 be a good family car? As long as you don't live in a snowy place, um, because those things, uh, obviously, a rear-wheel drive, very powerful, so you don't want to... Um, you know, drive it in the rain too aggressively, things like that. But it's a very nice vehicle. I mean, my wife leases a C300. The current Gen C class is a very, very nice car. I think it has probably the nicest interior in its class. And with the C63, you get a fantastic sound, obviously amazing performance. Um, so you can go watch my review for, uh, you know, all my thoughts on the C63. I did uh, review the sedan a couple of years ago now, but um, fantastic car and definitely would recommend for sure. Um, all right, we got some work. We got a lot of comments piling in here, so I'm just going to start from the bottom and try and pick through them as best as I can. Um, someone says, thoughts on Pontiac. I wish they were still around. Another person says, thoughts on the new LT1 Camaro. Um, I think that's a solid package, and I hope that that is uh, something I can review here soon, but Chevy, unfortunately, hasn't had any Camaro press vehicles. I've been begging and pleading over the past year for them, and they just haven't gotten any in. I think they kind of didn't want to promote the 2019 body style a whole lot because they got so much backlash. So they changed it. And, you know, now it's just waiting for the 2020s, but it's starting to get cold here and stuff. So we'll have to see. David T, thank you so much for the super chat. He says, uh, have an 18 F30 BMW 340i X Drive M Sport, manual all wheel drive turbo, inline six, gray metallic with red leather. Convinced it's the perfect one car vehicle. Thoughts? Um, you know, I still really need to drive the M Sport version of the three series because I reviewed, uh, you know, I think it was a 2016 or 15 uh, three series of 335, I think it was. Um, and that F30 generation, I wasn't really impressed with it. Um, the one I even drove as a manual. And the handling was just way too soft, for my opinion, of what I'm looking for from a sports sedan. And um, so I was a little bit disappointed, honestly, with the current Gen 3 series, or I guess now the previous Gen 3 series. Um, but I have not driven an M Sport one. And a lot of people tell me that the M Sport package makes a huge difference. And I do have someone that's offered one to me to review, but unfortunately, they're uh, in Georgia, which is a long way from Pittsburgh here. So I don't know when I'll get to reviewing that, but I do want to review one of the M Sport package. Um, but as my experiences so far, I'm not in love with the current Gen 3 series, but I know a lot of people are. So um, I'm sure it's a fantastic car for you. And the thing is, you know, this is one thing I always, I get a lot of people that ask me, you know, what car would you buy, this or that? And it's like, you don't really want to know what I want to buy because I have different priorities and tastes and wants and needs than what you often do. And so, you know, just because I love something doesn't necessarily mean you will and vice versa. So that's kind of why when I do my reviews, I present the information and I say, here's how it feels. If you like this feeling, great. If you don't, you know, whatever. So I'll say this car is stiff or it's soft. People might love a stiff ride or a soft ride. And I kind of leave that up to the person to decide. So um, I try and always keep things middle of the road there with that. But um, JDM Car says, thoughts on the new Supra? You can hear all my thoughts on that in uh, my review of the Supra. And I'm hoping to get one for a week to do a, a longer test of one. Um, but uh, in the meantime, you can just watch. I spent a day with the Supra, and uh, it's fantastic. So <laughs> lots of good accelerations and reactions in that one. Um, Smile from Al says, do you reckon you can meet Shmi 150 when he visits Pittsburgh? I did not know he's visiting Pittsburgh. Uh, maybe he announced that in a video that I didn't watch yet or something. Um, but if he visits Pittsburgh, I'd love to swing by. I've met him several times, and I actually bumped into him at the New York Auto Show uh, back in April, and he's super nice still. He's he, I met him back in 2015 whenever Ford debuted the Ford GT, um, and that was a, an awesome event. But anyway, I got to hang out with him for a while there. Super nice guy. I love Shmi. He's awesome. So uh, if he's going to be in Pittsburgh, as long as I'm in town, I will totally try and meet up with him. That'd be awesome. Nick C asks, um, how do you feel about the new Porsche Taycan? And um, that's, um, 
I think I'm going to have to wait and see how it drives because it sounds promising, but then it's also very heavy. And, you know, I don't know. Tesla seems to still be doing really, really good stuff. And I mean, I don't know how well it's going to handle and stuff. So that's kind of the, the last thing to really wonder about. But I, I've heard from some people that uh, were on the launch that um, it was a little glitchy and there's, I don't know. I'm just, I'm waiting to see how that whole thing unveils and how it kind of rolls out because with, new technology and stuff it's not going to be as straightforward to launch a car as it used to be with you know here's how it drives and here how it is if there's all this new technology it's going to be really interesting to see how that stuff holds up to chang thank you for another super chat he says what do you think is the next dying brand that's actually a perfectly timed question because i just read an article today on jalopnik about infinity and infinity is getting killed right now even their best-selling model was down 50% in sales for this month uh, or for September and all their models are doing very poorly and infinity just pulled out of Europe. Um, and now in the Pittsburgh area, we have a decent amount of people. I see a lot of infinities around. We have a pretty big new dealership for infinity and stuff nearby. Um, but it seems like the rest of the country, it, no one is buying infinities. So um, if I had to take a guess, it'd be a tie between that and Fiat as far as U S brands leaving. Um, I love Fiat and I hope they do well. And I think they're committed to staying here, but they're also really struggling. So we'll have to see. Justin, thank you for the super chat as well. He says, at work right now, so won't be able to watch much, but just want to say, love your vids. Keep them up, man. Been watching for about five years now. Thank you for the support and for the super chat and for uh, watching it work very briefly. I appreciate that. Um, and uh, this will be available, by the way, this whole live stream, you can watch it uh, later on. It's going to be uh, available to watch back after it's over. So um, you can catch up if you want, but it's going to be two hours. So I don't blame you for not watching a two hour long video if uh, you, know, you don't have the time later. But I very much appreciate you uh, tuning in and all the support over the years. Um, MD Sh Shamir says, which would you pick, Evo or STI? I love the STI. Uh, that would be my pick for sure. Uh, Evo is just a little bit more of a crude interior, even though it drives slightly better as far as handling. Um, but now the new STI, the, the newer STI is so good with its handling that I don't think the Evo has much of an edge like it used to. Um, other questions here, 2020 Titan thoughts. I kind of mentioned that in my weekly update uh, two weeks ago now where I talked about the uh, 2020 Titan it's uh, you know, they made some improvements, but the domestic truck market is just so competitive. Uh, I just think the Titan is probably still would be my last pick as far as picking a truck in uh, the current model year here. Uh, Mike says, Hey Matt, what are your thoughts on the new Lamborghini? Um, guessing you're meaning the Scion or whatever it's called. Um, yeah, it looks very cool. Honestly, you know, I talked about it in the weekly update and it sounds promising. You know, I do really admire that Lamborghini is sticking to nationally aspirated engines, just doing the hybrid thing on top of that, instead of going turbo, everything like Ferrari is. Um, I think that's, that's the kind of the way I would prefer everyone to go is just, you know, have the hybrid thing. I think that's great. And whenever you need the electrification, go for it. But, you know, turbos, it's a hit or miss type of thing. And I, I really think for the super tar, super cars, having, you know, the naturally aspirated sound to me just makes it a little bit of a sweeter experience. Um, but that's just my opinion. Um, Tej says new M4 thoughts. Oh, well, I guess we don't really know much about it yet, right? I mean, unless I missed an article in the past day or two, but I haven't seen anything really about the new M4 um, aside from, you know, just the rumors and stuff. And of course, we just saw the four series uh, concept, I guess, at uh, Frankfurt. And so, you know, I talked about that in a couple weekly updates ago, and that looks uh, very interesting. I think actually the huge grill kind of works. Uh, so if they make it more aggressive for the M4, it could be very cool. Um, other questions here. Uh, Naveen says, why is CarPlay or Android Auto important if an infotainment is well-designed like Toyota and Tune? Um, so I think the main appeal with uh, the smartphone integration is that it can run the apps that you want it to run. For example, I personally run Waze for all my navigation stuff, and Waze gives you heads up about cops and all that kind of stuff. And so just using a built-in navigation from Toyota or whatever, you don't get live traffic most of the time. Sometimes you get like serious live traffic, but it's not as accurate. Waze is super accurate with that stuff. It gives you warnings about 
potholes and uh, traffic and why traffic is backed up, not just that it is backed up, but Waze will be like, there's an accident ahead. That's why you're sitting in this traffic and here's how long it's going to take you to get through the traffic. And all those types of things are more advanced. Obviously the voice to text is a lot better when you use smartphone integration um, versus trying to use the uh, you know older systems you see in uh, all the other infotainment sy systems in their setup. So I think just overall, Smartphone companies do smartphone integration better than car companies do because car companies make cars, not, uh, you know, tech. And so I think just kind of letting everyone use their own strengths to do the best things possible is kind of why everyone likes the smartphone stuff, including myself. Uh, Tu Chang, thank you for another super chat. Uh, he says, so Friday, did anyone else realize the Super Rooks fan reference? Also, baby C8... Do, do, do. Okay, now I got it this time. <laughs> Last time I missed it, but I, I appreciate the uh, the reference there. But yeah, that, I, I did drop a like super WRX fan reference there mentioning uh, the WRX last week. But um, yeah, I'm, uh, I think I might work a, a kind of a super fan reference into, uh, into my 400,000 subscriber video that I'm going to be starting to work on here soon because, you know, we're coming up on 400,000 subscribers slowly, but surely I'm um, at like 397, I think. So, uh, you know, once the channel has 400,000, I will be doing a new compilation video of all my reactions, the best reactions uh, over the past 100,000 subscribers. And, um, and so that'll be fun. And I think I might do a little super expand thing uh, in that as well. Um, MD Shamir says Waze versus Google Maps. I personally prefer Waze. Uh, Google Maps is good. Apple Maps is okay. Um, but I personally think Waze is the best just for all the police notifications in case we don't do exactly the speed limit all the time, which I don't think anyone does. Um, Abel Lopez says, have you ordered your C8 or will you order one? I am not ordering one. Um, you know, it's kind of like the Supra where everyone ordered a Supra. And now there's like a dozen YouTube channels all talking about their Supras and building them and stuff. And, you know, that kind of stuff. I mean, that's kind of what helped my channel at the very beginning with the BRZ. I, I bought a BRZ and I was the only person like documenting my experiences of what it was like to own a BRZ. Uh, in those first few months. And so it really helped the channel. And I, I, I recognized the value of buying a very hyped up car and, you know, having everyone uh, be curious about what it's like and stuff. But with me, you know, I kind of learned with the EcoBoost uh, that doing modifications and stuff and trying to appeal to viewers, you know, all these build channels, it's like a never ending thing where it's like the car, unless the car is a 2000 horsepower race car, people aren't happy and there's always got to be something new to keep it fresh. And that's just, you know, it's like any other TV show or something. You got to have stuff to keep it fresh. You can't just, you know, be stale with it. And so with me, you know, like I actually was tempted to, to buy a super cause I would be curious to live with one and, you know, show what it's like to have one. Um, and I really like the Supra, but I wouldn't mod it uh, because I value having a reliable car. I don't like having a headache. I don't have time for a headache. I just don't have the space to even wrench on something, uh, even if I wanted to, you know, do a bunch of mods to it myself and everything. So I would, to me, I would, if I were to buy a C8, I would buy a C8 and be like, here it is. And I would do a few videos like I did with the bullet where I'm like, here's a few things about it. Here's what it's like to own. Here's what kind of fuel economy I'm getting, yada, yada, yada. And then that would be it. Like, what else have I done to the bullet? I haven't done any mods to the bullet. I just give an update whenever I think it's worth talking about an update. Um, and I bought the bullet for me. You know, if I bought it to get a bunch of subscribers, then I would have, you know, put the supercharger on from Lebanon for performance. And I would have, you know, just torn the whole thing apart. But then it's a car I don't want to live with. And it's a car I don't even want to own at that point. It's just a miserable thing that never would run and would just be a massive headache. So that's kind of why I steer clear of all that stuff. Um, I am thinking about doing down the road, like, uh, other vehicles that I want to buy and ownership experiences, but there would be a little bit more to talk about. Like I'm thinking about doing, um, other, other avenues. I won't get too specific. So I, I, it's, I think it's something that no one's really done yet before. Um, but I want to do something, um, kind of like that. And that I think th the type of vehicle I would pick would be something that would keep it fresh without me having to modify it. Um, so Anyway, um, two chanks is, but seriously, would it be smart to build a baby C8 like a V6 Fiero? Um, you know, I, it's tough because the price point is really tough to get to, to do something like that. I think, 
Um, you know, cause you have to get a certain level of performance. Look how many people hate the BRZ in the 86 cause they're not fast enough. And you have like Toyota made the MR2, which could be, you know, like it's a Fiero competitor. It was back in the day. And, um, you know, if the, if Chevy did an MR2 type vehicle that, you know, had maybe like the Camaro V6 or had um, a four cylinder turbo or something, you know, would it, would it sell? Would people want it? I mean, very few people bought an MR2. How many people do you see that love MR2s these days? I mean, there's a small community of people that love the older ones, but like the newest version of the MR2, like very few people bought, hardly anyone owns one or talks about them these days. Um, and so I think it would be tough to make it fast enough. And I think 60 grand is so cheap for the C8 that people would just want to go for the real thing instead of a smaller one. But that's my opinion. William Long, thank you for the super chat. Um, and then also I'll get to... Um, Rithik Patel and your super chat. Thank you so much for that as well. But first, William, he says, with self-driving cars on the horizon, how do you think we can keep the younger generations engaged to keep car culture thriving? Um, you know, I don't think car culture at, is as in danger as a lot of um, you know articles make it out to be. I think um, car racing games and stuff really are doing a good job of staying relevant and keeping people engaged. Like honestly, as a kid, that's how I got into cars was video games. My parents weren't into cars or anything. It was just, I was like, hey, Gran Turismo 2 looks kind of cool. Maybe I'll buy that. And I'm like, oh wait, I can like modify cars and I can do all these things. And I think that's kind of what got me into it. And you see like mobile games like CSR racing and stuff are super popular and you got Forza Horizon and all those types of things. And I think with gaming being so popular and so many games being racing games, I think that's going to keep um, that alive a little bit. Um, and I don't know. I think that uh, just in general, car companies are making exciting cars. So that's keeping uh, people interested. Obviously, you're going to have people who just, I think, you know, you can, I think there are some people that can kind of, go from being a non-car person to a car person, but I think it's either something you get or you don't. It's either just transportation and you're like, so what? Or you get it. And I think there's always going to be those amount of people that just get it and those who don't. And there's gonna be very little crossover. Um, and I think there are still a lot of people that do get it. And um, I think hopefully it'll, it'll continue on. But uh, Rithik, uh, thank you for your super chat as well. He says, favorite new performance car under $50,000. Under 50,000, um, I think, you know, the Mustang is really one of my favorites still. And you can get a performance pack level one for under 50 grand, very nicely equipped. Um, those are fantastic. And if you're, I think you can technically, technically get a super under 50, I think they're like 49, nine or something. I think the super is uh, also one of my favorites, but other than that, Miata, 2019 Miata, 25, 30 grand, by far the most fun per dollar out of a new car experience I think you can get. Um, I love the 2019 Miata. And that is another car I would consider adding to my garage at some point. But again, I would buy it for me and as a fun weekend vehicle. And I'd talk about what it's like to own, but then I would do no modifications and <laughs> it would go nowhere on the channel. Um, but uh, other questions here. Um, we have uh, Taillights Be Like uh, says, do you watch... Mars Speed on YouTube. I do not. I've never heard of them, um, but uh, I can check them out if you want to send a link over. Um, I'm always interested in seeing new channels. Uh, other stuff here. Uh, Abel says, do you support YouTube channels that stage their videos? Not putting anyone on blast. Uh, will you ever stage content? Um, I'm trying to think of like what you're referring to. Uh, as far as like, I mean, I guess there's some people that, you know, maybe f do fake drama or whatever. And I guess that's what you're referring to. And I, I, I don't know. I mean, my channel, I try and be more professional. Obviously I have the personal aspect where I talk about, you know, my car or like my wife's car I'll be talking about here this month. If you follow me on Instagram and stuff, you'll see, we're going to be doing some stuff with her car. Um, but other than that, it's just reviews and news and, um, I try and keep a level of professionalism with that. And so that's why I don't really do clickbait. I don't, um, you know, do anything misleading or anything like that. It's just, here's this review. If you want to watch it, great. If you don't, whatever, like, um, you know, I, I try and be pretty straightforward with all that stuff. So I will never stage content. Um, I would rather quit YouTube than join the clickbait, uh, rat race. I like to call it of just constantly trying to one up myself and sensationalize every single little thing. It's just exhausting. There's a huge burnout rate with that kind of stuff. Um, I always build my YouTube channel to be something that I can sustain. I want this to be my career. I don't want to just cash in after five years and retire. Like I'm doing this because I love reviewing cars and I want to do it 
as long as I possibly can. And so that's why I've always done this um, consistently and done it, you know, in a way that I can continue to do it, you know, and it, it's not going to burn me out too much. Um, other questions here. Um, UJW Gaming says, will you review a 2011 to 2015 Chevy Cruze? Uh, no, I will not. So with my car reviews, I always try and pick vehicles that I think you guys want to see. Um, cause there are cars that I'm personally maybe curious about, uh, driving, but then they don't do well. Like for example, I was super excited about the 1957 Ford Ranchero review that I posted at the beginning of this year. And I was like, well, this is something different. Maybe people will, you know, find it interesting and, you know, something out of the ordinary. No one watched that review video. And that's like reinforcing, you know, if it's something that's going to get views, I'll do it, but I'm not going to spend, you know, two to three days working on a video, um, you know, to then have no one watch it. Like it's, that's just, it's just doesn't make sense. Um, so I've, and it is like, you know, I'm doing this as my full-time career and as a business. So I have to do stuff that's going to give me a return on my time. And so um, stuff like that, um, you know, is very little audience, at least with my audience. I know you guys like fast cars and interesting cars. Uh, I do, you know, some of the mainstream stuff, uh, you know, some SUVs and things like that, just because there are so many people that are looking for those videos. And it's a very important part of the car market that I don't want to ignore. Um, but overall, I try and, you know, stick to the most interesting stuff. Um, Gus says, do you own a Tesla? If not, would you consider one? I do not own a Tesla. Um, I would consider one. I was actually very impressed. I got to review my buddy Sophie on uh, Redline Reviews uh, Model 3 Performance uh, a couple of months back, and you can go watch that video. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's a very interesting car. Um, I, I hope the company stays healthy enough because I think I, like I mentioned actually in my weekly update this past week, you know, I really respect the fun that Tesla has, but then you see the whole fiasco with the smart summon feature going on this past week. And it's just like, it's just, they're trying to rush things, I think a little bit too much. And I get that they want to be the first and they want to, you know, be a pioneer. And these are some of the costs of being a pioneer is you get to beta test everything for everyone. Um, but personally, um, I think, you know, I'm curious to see what the other manufacturers do in regards to electric cars and, you know, if they're able to, you know, do stuff that is uh, a little more stable, um, something that's, you know, going to be a good competitor to the Teslas, then, um, you know, I would probably be more inclined to get one of those brands because they have better service and all that type of stuff. Because that's one thing, you know, if your Tesla gets wrecked, it's like waiting months for parts and stuff. It's just, there's a lot of complications with Tesla ownership right now that I wouldn't, want to buy in right now, but, you know, maybe in the future, if they work out their servicing and they work out their support network and stuff and things get a little more, I guess, reliable, then, you know, that would be something that I would be definitely curious about. And it's, it's a lot of fun. They're fantastic vehicles. Like I said, I respect them so much because they are still providing probably the best performance for an electric vehicle at the best price points and um, they've been doing it the longest and um, you know, their supercharger networks the best and everything. So I think there's, there's a lot uh, that I can respect Tesla for, but um, right now, I mean, I still personally, I mean, I have a big loud V8 muscle car <laughs> downstairs. So, I mean, that's, that's where my love is, uh, you know, driving something silent very fast is exciting, but I, I worry that it would kind of get old and I know that they do things to keep it fresh and it's kind of fascinating, but um, personally, I'm just sticking to the gas stuff and I'm enjoying it while I can, because I know that the future is electric. And I'm not going to be able to enjoy big, loud V8s forever. Um, and so I want to enjoy them while I can because uh, once they're gone or they're, you know, made illegal or whatever ends up happening, um, you know, it's going to be something I'll miss for sure. So enjoying the gas stuff while I can. Um, VW Motorsports, thank you for the super chat here. He says, 2019 GTI or 2019 Civic SI? Um, I personally like the GTI better. I think it handles better. Um, I think the interior is a little bit nicer and yeah. And then also, of course, if you want an automatic, the GTI is really the only way to go, but I just, I just like, it's a more of a, I guess, uh, what, I guess more like a go-kart than the Civic Si. Um, I am going to be driving the 2020 Civic Si, which has a few little tweaks, you know, it's got a 6% shorter final drive and stuff. I'm very curious to see how that, you know, does some changes, but honestly, I wasn't in love with the handling of the new gen Civic SIs. So personally, I would go GTI um, as of right now, but, you know, I might, might change my mind here once the 2020s come out and see how the, uh, you know, the changes affect that. Um, 
Other stuff, John says, how would you compare the upcoming LC500 convertible to the C8? Which one would you wait for to get? Um, well, I mean, there's going to be a pretty big difference. You can probably get a fully loaded C8 for the price of an LC500 uh, convertible. So um, I love the LC500 and it's gorgeous, but I would probably get the C8 over it um, if it were my money, um, just because I'd probably end up you know, spending way less than the LC500 convertible, which will probably be over $100,000. Um, and the C8 is uh, seems to be pretty fantastic. Um other stuff here, um, any mods done to the bullet? Uh, no, nothing other than, you know, I did last year the uh, Expel paint protection film on the front end. I did a ceramic coating on it, the blackout tinting put on, um, and then also the window tint, and that's it. Um, nothing else planned for the bullet. It's just, I'm just going to be uh, enjoying uh, enjoying the car. Um, all right, other things here. Um Bike Knight says, question, what happened with the Mini Cooper you had? I'm looking into buying one, but worried about reliability. Um, yeah, so minis seem to be a luck of the draw thing. Um, I've heard lots of horror stories, mine included, and I've heard lots of good things uh, from people who have good luck with minis. Um, for example, my mini uh, fell apart within six months. My friend had a Mini Cooper S, same R56 generation, and his, he didn't have any issues over, I think he had his for like three or four, maybe even five years. He loved it, had, never gave him any trouble. Um, and that seems to be the consensus that I've seen out there is you either get a good one or you get a bad one and that's it. Um, so let's, uh, yeah, you can go watch all the mini videos and the updates if you'd like, but within six months, um, the clutch started going, uh, which is like a three grand job. The water pump failed. And what was the other thing? Oh, and the thermostat uh, broke, like the valve on it broke. And so it overheated. And so two of those three things required a tow to the dealership, which was not fun. Um, Rithik, thank you again for the super chat. He says, best manual transmission cars for new drivers. Um, so I think as far as manuals go, one of the easiest ones is the previous gen Civic SI. So the ones that ended in like 2014 or 2015. Those are one of the easiest manuals to drive. I also think that the um, like the new Veloster Turbo manual is pretty easy. Uh, the new Corolla hatch is pretty easy. Uh, Miata is fairly easy. Uh, but the actually the Corolla hatch and the normal Corolla sedan with their intelligent manual they have for 2020 here in 2019, um, that actually will smooth out shifts as well. So it actually helps new drivers um, learn a manual. And I think that makes it one of the easiest vehicles to learn in that regard. Uh, Vinny, thank you also for the super chat. He says 2019 Jetta GLI Audubon or 2019 Accord 2.0 T. Um, so this one kind of comes down to what you prefer personally. So I did, you know, reviews on, um, both vehicles. I think I see the GLI seemed a little soft. I wasn't in love with how soft it felt for a sporty vehicle. I think honestly, the Accord has a firmer suspension that handles both better than the GLI. And that might be crazy to hear for some people, but to me, um, I would definitely, I think, go for the Accord over the GLI, but that's just, that's just me. The GLI does have a few cool, you know, uh, tricks up its sleeve with the ambient lighting and, um, you know, it does pipe in some sound and stuff, but honestly, I think the Accord uh, is a better driving vehicle and you have more space in the Accord. And I think it's a little higher quality feeling as well. Um, Humble Mechanic has joined us. Thanks for joining, man. Uh, that's awesome. Uh, we're, me, it's me, all the guys uh, from, if you guys ever follow the road to SEMA that we've done in the past several years, uh, we kind of became friends ever since that. And uh, so talk with Charles very often. And so thanks for joining, man. I appreciate it. Um, Brad says, best manual sports car with best feel under 50,000. I think Miata. That's got to go to the Miata again. Um, you know, Miata is almost half of that $50,000 price. And uh, it's one of the best ones out there. Um, John says, should they bring back G35, G37? I think they kind of do with, um, you know, the Q60 is in the new version of the G37 and G35 coupes. Um, as far as sedans go, I think the Q50 kind of was designed to replace those models. And so, um, I think, you know, maybe bring back, bring back the name, but I think they've kind of gone on to the Q thing and I think it's, it's a decent naming, you know, structure. And so, um, I think uh, that's kind of where you should be looking if you're looking uh, for a new version of those. Um, but like I said, Infinity could use the sales. Like I was mentioning earlier, they are not doing well currently. They are struggling to sell cars. Um, 
Other stuff, speaking of Infinities, John says uh, Q60 Red Sport 400 or M235i M240. Um, so it depends. How heavy do you like your vehicle to feel? Because both of them have a little bit of a weightier feel, but the M235i definitely feels lighter to me and a little bit sportier. But the Q60 is just gorgeous looking. I love the way the Q60 looks. And uh, very strong performance in a straight line. Handling is also pretty good. Um, I think from a reliability standpoint, if I were to own one or the other, I would rather have the Infinity because the uh, BMW will most likely cost you more in maintenance and in parts down the road. Um, I'm still very leery of German luxury vehicles that are older than three or four years old because um, they're bargains. But the reason why they're bargains is usually because they're not cheap to own um, once they get up there in age. So I would probably go the, for the Infinity personally. But um, other questions here. Uh, Jersey boy greaser says, which new sports car has the worst manual transmission? Um, honestly, I think, I guess worst, none of them are horrible, but I think both the Mustang and the challenger have very challenging, uh, manual transmissions. So, uh, the Mustang has this weird clutch spring and I, even I openly say like the bullet clutch is tricky and, uh, it, it's just, it's not a great clutch if you're not super good with manuals. Um, it's a little tricky and challenger has got a heavy old school feeling clutch and the shifter is kind of old school feeling as well. And, um, so those two take a little more muscle and a little more finesse to try and drive smoothly. So those are probably the most, the hardest ones that I can think of off the top of my head. Um, other questions here. Uh, Dave says 2019 Mustang GT six speed, 10 speed fun factor. Um, so I'm, as far as manual versus auto, I still say manual, the 10 speed automatic in the Mustang is fun. Um, it downshifts very quickly. And, you know, if you're drag racing, the 10 speed is going to be the way to go. Otherwise I think the six speed is more fun. You get the rev match downshifts now with the 2019s. And, um, I think it's fantastic. I know there's some people that have had issues with the transmission. Um, but I've seen people that have had issues with the 10 speed too. So I don't think either of them are bulletproof. Um, and I personally just think the six speed is way more fun. Uh, Jamie says Jeep Wrangler or Toyota Forerunner. Um, I would say, um, Forerunner if you want reliability, Jeep if you want the best off road capability. Um, and that's really what it comes down to, uh, in my opinion. Um, Donald Trump with uh, is uh, giving me a ten dollar super chat. Thank you so much for that. Uh, he says, Thoughts on the 2020 Tundra, and do you think Toyota will bring back the FJ to compete with the new Bronco? Do you think they will put the twin turbo V6 from the LS in the Tundra with a hybrid? I think you're spot on with the Tundra there. Um, having the twin turbo V6, that sounds those that all the rumors I've been hearing is that that's what it's going to do. The hybrid thing's going to probably be optional, but I think the twin turbo V6 is going to be their answer to the Ford EcoBoost. Um, so I think there's a pretty good chance of that happening. Um, but as far as any other stuff I've heard, it, you know, could get an independent rear suspension or some type of other uh, different suspension setup on the Tundras. But again, that's all um, very well hidden behind camouflage. So it's hard to say yet, you know, what's going on with that for sure. Um, but as far as the, I think that's going to be a 2021 model year anyway, I think 2020 just gets like Apple CarPlay and Android Auto and the head unit and that's it. Um so yeah, not much. I think the Tundra is pretty dated at this point. It's good if you want a reliable truck, um, but if you you know want something with a lot of features or a nice interior, um, I think a lot of the other competitors are a little bit better. Um, but as far as Toyota bringing back the FJ to compete with the new Bronco, um, you know, I think because there was that rumor about them doing that um, FT4X or whatever that uh, was a concept that they came out with. And I think they're kicking around the idea of doing it. And I think um, not FJ, but they're, they, I think TJ Cruiser or something, something with the Cruiser name was copyrighted recently. Um, and so I think Toyota is working on something. Everyone is looking at Jeep with Envy right now and they want in on that off-road fun kind of uh, action. So I think there's going to be lots of Jeep competitors here coming out in the next few years. Um, and so the Bronco of course is the main one, but I think a lot of companies are going to be rushing to do something like that. Um, other things here. Uh, thank you, uh, Berkeley Stinson, for the super chat as well. Uh, he says, would you rather own a G37 Coupe or an IS350? Um, so I guess if you don't care about two doors versus four, then I would probably go for the G37. It has a better sounding V6, in my opinion. I like um, the styling of it a little bit better than the IS350. 
Um, but I think if you want the most reliable thing, the IS350 would be the way to go. And obviously it's more practical with the four doors. Um, but the IS350 actually is very good as well. I think it's, it, it handles better than most people give it credit for. And um, it's a really solid uh, luxury vehicle that I think is often overlooked when it shouldn't be. But um, yeah, personally, I think the G37 Coupe is a little bit more fun um, for me. But um, Omarion says, is Jeep okay to you? Um, so I think Jeep is a great company. And, um, you know, I think they make really there again, like how Tesla I was mentioning earlier has this fun factor. I think Jeep Jeep gets that as well. They're very popular around here. I mean, so many people have Wranglers and stuff around here, even if they just use them as commuter vehicles. Um, it's just got this baked in fun that I think a lot of people are really resonating with right now. Um, personally, you know, I don't think I would ever own a Jeep, but I think, you know, they have been making improvements and, um, you know, I think they're, they're doing better. Um, but yeah, I think there's, there's still, I'm excited to see what new developments Jeep has here. You know, there is spy recently, the new grand Cherokee, which is going to be, I think really impressive. And I think if Jeep continues on with like Ram started with the Ram 1500 and having a mind blowingly nice interior, I think if they can you know translate that over to Jeep and improving some of the interiors on the Jeeps and stuff with these new gen versions, then it's going to really be amazing as well. Um, we got Jaw R Dien. Uh, I'm probably butchered your username. I'm sorry, but he says Volkswagen Golf R or Kia Stinger GT. Currently in the market for a four door sports car. Uh, maybe there's another valid option. Um, so yeah, it's you know definitely again comes down to your needs and what you're looking for and stuff. Practicality wise, the Stinger has a way bigger hatch. So if you're buying one of these vehicles because you like practicality, the Stinger wins by default because it's just got a way bigger hatch. Um, and I think the Stinger interior is actually nicer and more luxurious than the Golf R. It feels way faster than the Golf R. Um, it's more exciting than the Golf R, both to look at and to drive. Um, the only thing is the Stinger feels heavier in corners than the Golf R. Um, the Golf R doesn't feel super light either, but the Stinger feels a little bit weightier and heavier and bigger because it is. And so I guess that's kind of what it comes down to is what would you rather have as far as driving dynamics? Do you want something small and lighter? Or are you okay having a little bit more weight and having all those extra features that I mentioned? Um, so that's kind of what it comes down to. Um, as far as other four-door sports car options, I love the Julia. The Alfa Romeo Julia is uh, one of my other favorites, as long as you're okay with taking the risk on reliability. Um, and uh, yeah, that's that's about it. Also, the Regal GS is fantastic too, and also does have a bit of a hatch to it. Um, and that's another one that gets often overlooked, but I think especially used, you can get one of those things already. The new gen Regal GS for under 30 grand, really solid deal in my opinion. Um, other things here, uh, we have, um, son of Tamriel says, I like the R better too. Stinger is cool though. Uh, I mean, they're both fantastic vehicles. We are spoiled for choice, uh, these days. That is for sure. There's so many good cars. When you look back at like history and how things, how things were so bland in the seventies and the eighties in so many ways, and even into the nineties, uh, we have so many fun cars. This is really a golden age, um, for enthusiasts right now. So yeah, there's very few wrong choices, honestly. Um, uh, we got uh, uh, Tommy. Thank you for the super chat. Um, he says, so next car, you'll be taking down a back road. So the next review that I'll be posting is the 2020 Dodge Charger Hellcat Widebody. So I was just on the media launch for that here this past week in Sonoma, California. Went around Sonoma Raceway in that thing. And I'm not allowed to talk about driving impressions until Wednesday. Uh, that review is going to be going live actually at 12.01 a.m. because that's when the embargo lifts on Wednesday morning. So basically at midnight on Tuesday there. Um, and so that'll be the next vehicle. And uh, it is a fantastic one, that is for sure. Um, so anyway, um, that would, that's going to be the next one. And, um, then there's a, I got a whole laundry list of cars. I've been, I've been filming a lot recently and backlogging a lot of stuff so that I have some fun cars to post over the winter time, because, you know, last winter I kind of ran out of sports cars and stuff to film and post because, uh, you know, here in Pittsburgh, it gets snowy and miserable to film, you know, once uh, January and February hit. And so, um, you know, I've had to do some SUVs and other all-wheel drive vehicles in the past um, over the wintertime. But this year, 
I went and did a couple extra trips to film a bunch of cars that I'll be revealing and you know posting over the winter time. And um, so I'll have a lot of exciting stuff still during the winter. And you'll look at the video and you'll be like, it looks like it's summer. Um, and so it's going to be a little bit of a you know dated look to them. But there's going to be a lot of fun reviews I'll be posting over the winter time. Um, Brad asks, are you going to the Tokyo Auto Show? I am not. I would love to, um, but uh, paying for flights and hotel to fly all the way to Tokyo, um, the views on the channel just are not enough um, to justify that financially. And that's, again, where it comes down to being a business. Um, most of the time, auto shows, the videos don't do very well for me. Um, and I know it's like I'm bombarding everyone with their sub boxes and uploading like three videos a day whenever I have the auto show stuff coverage. Um, but so... Yeah, can't justify going to auto shows anymore. I don't think the videos just don't get enough views to pay for the travel expenses. So, um, but yeah, other questions here. Uh, Joseph says, hey, Matt, Chrysler 300C or the BMW 328i in terms of reliability? I would say Chrysler is going to be more reliable as long as you're talking about the same model year between each, each that and the BMW. BMWs um, and any German vehicle for that matter um, can get kind of... Um, problematic, I guess is the word as the years go on. So I try and stay away from old German vehicles as a rule. Um, Rithik, uh, thank you for the super chat. Once again, uh, I really appreciate it. He's been doing a bunch here. Uh, really, I, I really appreciate it. You guys are awesome. Uh, he says, are you excited to see Peugeot returning to the U S? Um, I'm kind of indifferent. I'm also waiting that one out to see if it actually happens. Cause they're talking about like, yes, we're coming. Um, and then it's, it's been, you know, a couple of years since they originally announced those plans. So, uh, we'll have to see what they actually come out with whenever they come here and stuff. And I mean, as you see with Fiat struggling and without Alfa Romeo, even not selling a ton of cars, you know, there's a lot of European brands that would love to sell here, but then are American consumers actually going to want to go for that? And again, like I said, we're spoiled for choice these days. Whenever you have so many good, solid, reliable family sedans, you know, unless Peugeot comes out with something with like crazy styling or something, I don't know why someone would do something like a Peugeot, which historically hasn't been super reliable. Why would they pick that over a comparable Honda, Toyota, even Kia, Hyundai, something like that, that have way longer warranties, that are way more reliable, have an established dealer network? It's just a really uphill battle. Um, so, you know, I'm always excited for more choices and more competition. I hope that things, you know, work out for them, but I'm not holding my breath. Uh, Sonic Boom says, is this your new house? It is not my new house. Um, I wish it was, but uh, hoping to move next year. But in the meantime, uh, have not moved. This is just the other side of my office. So, um, you know, usually whenever I'm doing the weekly updates, um, I'm facing the other way. And so this is just the other way. So this is, um, you can see I did this in the last one. That's my uh, iMac that I edit on. And that's the other side of my little office here that I do the weekly updates in, but no, not a new house. Um, hopefully that'll be coming next year with more garage space. That's the thing I desperately need. So I can actually buy some more cars and do some more stuff. Um, other things here, Joe asks, what is Nissan revealing at the Tokyo auto show that you hinted at? Um, I mentioned this a little bit earlier. Um, so I've heard stuff about new Z's, but, um, I don't want to get too specific. Uh, just basically, um, I'm excited for, you know, if they do a new Z, I'm not sure if that's what they'll be showing at Tokyo. I just heard that the new Z is actually coming and someone has actually seen it. Um, and that's, uh, that's about it. Um, so I've heard it could be using existing powertrains. Uh, you can probably figure that one out pretty easily. Um, and that it's going to have, some styling cues from the past. And that's um, about all I can say about that without giving away my uh, my source too much. Um, but yeah, so I'll be curious to see if that's what they actually show at Tokyo. There might be other things they show at Tokyo instead. I'm not sure. Um, Ryan L., thank you for the super chat. He says, hey, Matt, love your channel. Keep it up. Have you driven an Alpha Julia QV? What's your thoughts? I have not driven the Quadrifolio. I uh, did do the Quadrifolio version of the Stelvio, which obviously uses the same engine and the same platform. Um, so you can probably you know, see in the Stelvio Quadrifolio video, my most of how I will feel about the Julia Quadrifolio, they'll probably be fairly similar in a lot of ways. Um, but uh, I have not driven one. I've driven, obviously, the standard Julia. 
loved that car so much. So amazing. I think it's the new benchmark in the sports sedan segment, and it still is even a couple of years after it's uh, been launched. So still love that, um, but I would love to do a Quadrifoglio version. There is someone actually, excuse me, in uh, Boston, I think that offered one to me, but I just, that's a long drive. So haven't gotten a chance to review it yet, but I'm hoping to review one eventually for sure. Um, other stuff here. Um, SK8 says, would you still recommend the 2016 Mustang GT after driving the new model? I don't want the digital dash or 10 speed. So not sure if 2018 and up is worth it. Um, you know, it, I guess it kind of depends on if you want the extra power. William, thank you for the super chat as well. I'll get to your question here in a second. Um, but as far as the GT goes, I still love the 2016. The gear ratios are a little shorter in the 2016 and 2017s and the 15s over the 18s. They made the gearing a little taller in those. So I would uh, actually say that my 2016 Mustang probably felt a little punchier in the lower RPMs than even my Bullet does. Um, so that's something that is nice about the older ones. Um, and if you don't care about the new stuff, then honestly save your money and just go for a 16. I think they're fantastic still. I still love the 16s have the hood vent turn signals and you still get Apple CarPlay and all that kind of stuff uh, with that new screen. So that I think that'd be the way to go. Uh, William, though, thank you for the super chat. And he says, have you driven an original NSX? Please review. I definitely want to review one. I did drive one once and I did a very brief little video on it. This was... I think now five years ago, whenever I was in California and I met up with the uh, BRZ and 86 uh, owners club out there, it was a great group, group of uh, guys and girls. We met up uh, just some random night whenever I was out there and uh, one of the guys had an NSX and he let me drive it. Um, I'm not even sure what the title of the video was for you to look it up, but there's a brief little uh, shot of me accelerating in the NSX and what it was like. Um, but I'm trying to even remember what the name of that video was. It was just like I did a video on like uh, the meet that I was at. Um, I'm trying. If you just type in NSX on the channel, then maybe something will come up. I honestly, I'm sorry. I wish I could even remember. That was so long ago. I don't even remember the title of that video. Um, but I did drive one once and it was awesome. They're so amazing. It just feels like you're driving in a bubble that just has awesome sound, awesome power, and awesome handling. Um, but yeah. Hoping to review one eventually, but I have not had an opportunity uh, to review one yet from anyone. So with any of my reviews, it's just me waiting for an opportunity. You know, I I can't just go pick cars. Um, you know, even with the press fleet ones, I have to ask for cars and hope that I get them. And with privately owned vehicles, you know, it's just waiting for an owner to be like, hey, I have an NSX and I'm in Pittsburgh. Like, come review it. Um, or somewhere within driving distance. You know, I, I, I will usually drive a few hours to film something if I think it's going to be worth it, um, but haven't had any offers nearby yet. Um, first drive of an N first drive in an NSX is the title. Thank you for finding that. Wow. That was fast. That's impressive. Thanks for doing that. Son of Tamriel. Um, so yeah, uh, that's the video then. So you can go watch that and see my acceleration reaction to an NSX. I wasn't pushing it too hard because the guy that was uh, riding along with me, was the owner and I didn't want to, you know, push it too much, but he, uh, he let me go for a couple little accelerations. Um, VW Motorsports says, Matt, will you drive my 91 GTI down a back road? I would love to, if you're nearby, send me an email. I have all my contact stuff in the description. Uh, you can, uh, reach out, send me an email. Uh, and, uh, yeah, I would love to review that if you're nearby. That's, those are the really, the really light GTIs. Those are a blast. I'm sure. Um, to Chang, thank you again for the super chat. He says, question from my girlfriend. Is this the Linus tech tips of the car community? Me? No, he's too low budget for that. Um, I don't actually watch Linus tech tips. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm, I'm definitely not the most, um, fancy channel as far as, you know, camera gear and filming and all that kind of stuff. I try and, I try and keep things very casual. Um, I think whenever there's a big production and things are very polished, that sometimes actually is a turnoff to some people because, you know, they, it, it, kind of hinders the relatability versus me just being a normal guy without a script, without my, you know, fancy camera crew following me around. It's just me in a car with a camera on the windshield, just saying, here's how it feels. And I think people kind of appreciate that casualness. And that's kind of why people say, you know, you say, um, and you know, all the time. And I fully understand that. It's just like, when I'm talking off the cuff, I'm not well-spoken enough to use big words and fancy language whenever I'm trying to focus on driving in a sporting manner 
and saying the right specs and also talking well. And so that's why, you know, I kind of need a split second to think. And that's why I kind of have some filler words and stuff like that. So it's not the most polished thing, but I, I personally like that I don't have a script and I don't, you know, I just kind of am doing it very casually. And I think, uh, you know, most people uh, that at least subscribe obviously appreciate that. And uh, hopefully others who don't subscribe also, you know, kind of appreciate that down to earth kind of uh, feel as far as car reviews go. Uh, Joe says, is there any new exciting things coming to the channel? Um, so I just did upgrade the camera gear a couple of months back. And I think that was a nice change because it allowed me to go to 60 frames per second, as well as having better video quality. Um, and I have the capability to go 4k, but that's just such a drain on editing, uh, in my computer, my iMac's a few years old. Um, so I don't know if it would handle it super well. Um, so I'm holding off on 4k and from what I've seen, it sounds like most people are watching on their phones and stuff these days. And the difference is harder to tell unless you're watching on a huge screen. Um, so I'm probably just going to, I think the 60 frames per second made a bigger difference in my opinion. Um, but obviously you guys can let me know your thoughts on that. But as far as other stuff, you know, like I said, I'm hoping to get a new house next year with more garage space, which will allow me to add more cars. So I have a little more variety and a little more of a personal side to the channel of giving updates on other vehicles instead of just my bullet. Um, and uh, otherwise I'm trying to think, I don't think there's really anything else new. It's just, there's, that's the nice thing with my channel is there doesn't have to ever be any new thing. There doesn't have to be any kind of drama. It can just be, Hey, there's an awesome new car coming out and the car uh, industry just provides the excitement. That's just, you know, Hey, there's a new wide body charger and the review of that'll be coming out next week. And that's exciting. And there's um, you know, just always new cars. There's always new things to talk about. And like I said, we're in this golden age of uh, car world, in my opinion, where everything's so exciting. There's so many cool things going on and changing and happening um, that that uh, to me is, uh, I think, a lot of excitement. And hopefully you guys agree. Um, Danny says, will you upgrade to iMac Pro? No, I, I do not make enough money to ju justify an iMac Pro. Those things are what, like, I think six grand for the cheapest one or something. They're insanely expensive. No, that would be nice if I, I would definitely be able to do 4K videos if I had one of those, but uh, could not justify that, I don't think. Um, Gaming with Musk says, do you plan to review more exotics such as the McLaren 720S? I love seeing you turn onto the back road and accelerate. I appreciate that. So I actually already did a McLaren 720S about a year ago or so. Uh, so you can go search that one on the channel. I've also done the 570S Spider and um, did a Lamborghini a while back, did an Aston Martin a long time ago. Um, so I did a few of those, but honestly, those videos don't do very well for me. Um, so I think, you know, as far as my channel goes, I think a lot of my fans really appreciate, uh, and you guys can obviously weigh in on this, but I, I've noticed that, you know, Japanese stuff or American stuff usually does best on my channel. Um, and it's relatable cars. You know, a lot of people get bored with seeing every $300,000 car that, you know, most of us will never be able to afford. So it's just kind of like, what's even the point of watching this review? If it's something I'll see three times in my life and, um, it's something that, you know, most of us, it's just a dream and, you know, uh, that's it. So, I think that's why I stick to more affordable stuff, but I do love, I mean, like that 720S was wild and I would love to review every supercar in existence. Um, and if I got the opportunity, I wouldn't turn them down. Um, but, uh, you know, I don't get many of those opportunities. And uh, like I said, they don't do great views wise. So I don't really worry about it um, as much fun as they are. Uh, other stuff, Kraken uh, says, hi, Matt, how do you find winter driving in a bullet? Um, so I've never driven mine in the, in the winter, as far as snow goes, you know, I do last winter, I did drive it a little bit in January and February, whenever it was a warmer day, but with, I didn't swap over to snow tires or winter tires. So I have just the Michelin pilot sport 4s tires and those it's not recommended to drive when it's below 40 degrees Fahrenheit. So, um, that's most of the winter here. So the bullet sits in the garage most of the winter and I don't drive it uh, most of the time. So um, if it's dry, you know, then I will take it off. It's below 40 degrees. Um, and it's fine in that you just like any rural drive, high horsepower car, you just have to be very delicate with your throttle inputs and not go crazy when it's cold. Um, but other than that, you know, it got around fine. And I did put snow tires on my previous Mustangs and you can go watch, uh, if you search like snow driving in a Mustang on YouTube, it should come up and, uh, it does pretty well with snow tires though. You know, there's a snow and wet mode you can put the car into and it kind of figures things out a lot better. Um, but anyway, uh, smile per mile says, 
I liked how you set your POV camera on your bullet drive video. Most people who do POV videos set their cameras on their forehead so it looks unrealistic. Yeah, that's kind of always been one of the reasons why I didn't do more POV videos um, because the way that I do POV videos um, is I do use a forehead you know, mount thing um, the GoPro has, but I just hang the camera upside down. But it's like literally like in like almost in my eyes. So it's, it's a, it's, I can see, okay, but it just like kind of gives me a headache after all having this thing, like kind of in my peripherals a little bit. Um, so I don't do POV videos very often for that reason. Cause it's not very comfortable to like doing that bullet drive video. Wasn't the most comfortable thing. Um, but that's how I got the right angle. And I think that's important. If you're doing a POV video, you want to see a point of view, a real point of view, not the point of view of some giant and you're staring at the headliner for half the video. So um, yeah, I, it's, that's kind of just, you know, how I like doing when there are a few channels that do very good uh, POV videos, uh, but there's a lot that it's just, it doesn't look very realistic. You're right. Um, Cleric says, when you buy the Corvette C8, I mentioned this a little bit earlier, I will not be buying the Corvette C8 as promising as it is um, cause every YouTuber is going to have one and I will not, I wouldn't be able to do anything different than what everyone else does. So, um, to me, it's kind of a, a pointless thing, um, uh, but they are very sweet. Uh, it'd be fun to own, but I love my bullet and I'm going to stick with that. Um, Ian's here. Thank you, Ian. He's the one who has the GMC Cyclone, um, that I got to review, uh, about a month or two ago now. Um, so he says, hi, Matt, how did the Cyclone feel acceleration wise compared to other all wheel drive vehicles you've driven? Um, it was actually fairly similar um, to other all-wheel drive vehicles, you know, especially with the launch that we did with that, you know, the brake torquing launch that uh, you showed me, Ian. It's it's fantastic. And um, as far as how it compares, um, you know, all-wheel drive cars, like a lot of them, like the WRX and stuff, you can't really launch it too hard if you value your uh, transmission and stuff. So, uh, you know, I think as far as how it compares, I'm trying to think of what it would compare to. Um, you know, I would say it was, it's, I think appropriate for its horsepower level. I think, you know, it's similar to other, you know, 250 horsepower, 300 horsepower, all wheel drive cars. Like for example, like the golf R I was talking about earlier, it feels very similar to like a golf R or something like that. Uh, obviously the golf R has faster shifts and it's a little more aggressive off the line, but a similar type of G force, I think, uh, at least from my, um, you know, standpoint, that's kind of how it felt to me. Uh, Jeffrey says, would you recommend the RCF or the Mustang GT? Um, obviously the RCF is going to be a little bit more expensive uh, for a comparable year versus the Mustang. So I guess part of it comes down to if you're willing to spend that extra money and you value the luxury, then I think the RCF would be the more fun choice. Um, if you're looking, if you can spend the money and you're looking for luxury, otherwise I think that the Mustang is a better value and is uh, a little more exciting. It's a little quicker, I think, especially if you go automatic versus automatic. Um, but actually I will be, um, I talked about this a little bit. So I did film an RCF, a regular RCF um, that Lexus actually sent me a couple of weeks back and I'll be posting that video in like a week and a half. And um, I did kind of compare it to the Mustang and a few of the other competitors. So um, stay tuned for more in-depth thoughts there um, in that RCF video. Um, but, you know, I think the value just isn't super strong on the RCF unless you're buying a used one and you're keeping it for 10 years and you want that Japanese reliability. Um, otherwise I think the Mustang is probably the better buy. Um, other stuff here, uh, blackout, uh, 5.0 fan says, Hey Matt, I don't mean to be repetitive, but what do you think of the CVT WX for someone who cannot drive stick? Um, CVT WX, I have not actually driven, so I can't give a fair assessment but I can say that I did review the Forster XT, which has you know a similar powertrain, and that one had a CVT. Now this I this was like a 2014 or 2015 Forster XT that I reviewed, so probably a little bit dated, not the best um, representation of the new CVT WRX. But I think um, you know if you do manual mode, it's fun, um, and the manual shifts are fairly quick. If you really cannot drive manual or it doesn't make sense, like if you commute in lots of traffic or something, the CVT WRX is okay. I would just always drive in manual mode because if it's an automatic mode, just the it's just really slushy. I think Subaru's CVT isn't one of the best out there as far as driving feel goes. Um, but if you have to have a WRX and you have to have an automatic, I mean, you know, obviously go for it. Um, but personally, I wouldn't love that setup myself, I don't think. Um, and I think if you really want an automatic 
vehicle in that segment. Um, you know, I would probably go for like, I, I really like the uh, Stinger 2.0 T with its automatic. You get a real eight speed automatic and you have, um, you know, that, I guess just the nicer feel of it. And it's a little a tiny bit more expensive, but it's not a huge price difference, similar type of horsepower. And I think I would just go for a stinger 2.0 personally. Um, so, and then uh, we have Will here says, what are your thoughts on the 2020 automatic GT 500? Will you be looking to get one? No interest in the GT 500 personally, because I love the bullet and I'm going to be sticking with that. Um, and I'll, also it's really hard to use that much power on the street. Um, that goes for any car with that much horsepower. Um, and so I don't know what it's going to be like to drive because I haven't driven one yet, but, um, I will be going on the launch of the GT 500, which is happening uh, later this month. So I will have a review on the new GT 500. I didn't announce that yet. So you guys here in the live stream are the first to know I will be reviewing the GT 500 along with all the other, um, you know, outlets that are going to be, you know, able to drive that some of the first people to drive that car. So I'll be very curious to see how the GT 500 drives and I'm very excited for that. Um, so yeah, stay tuned. There will be a video, you know, I'm not sure when we'll be able to post those videos, but Probably either towards the end of this month, uh, somewhere around there is where I'm thinking. But Daniel, thank you for the super chat. He says, do you think a C7 with under 30,000 miles can be had for 30 grand next year? Would it be worth upgrading from a 2016 Mustang GT Premium? Um, you know, I haven't really kept an eye on the C7 market on the used market recently. Um, but from what I saw, I thought there was a few C7s already getting close to 30. So uh, if that's the case, then I would say, I think it's safe to say, I mean, because C7 came out with 2014 model year, some higher mile ones. I mean, 30,000 isn't too high, but I think something like that you could probably get for around 30 grand next year. Yeah, I think that's that's probably reasonable. Again, I would have to do a little bit more research to give you a, a strong answer, but I, I would say that's probably well with it. Honestly, it could even be lower than that. Um because it's it's just insane. I think there's going to be so many people trading them in. It's gonna. I mean, I know there's a few people in the C7 camp that are like, no, I want front engine. I'm never giving up my C7. But I think there's gonna be so many people trading them in um, that probably is worth. Now, as far as upgrading from your Mustang, you know, you just have to keep in mind um, that the Corvette's a little bit smaller. Um, it's uh, you know, it's it's just a little bit more aggressive in its setup. So you're sitting way lower. So getting in and out of it is a little more uh, of a task than a Mustang. Um, you have the hatch, but you don't have a traditional trunk. You don't have any kind of back seat. So as long as you don't care about any of those things, if it's just a fun car, you know, a weekend car or something like that, I don't know if I would want to daily drive a C7 personally, um, like I would with a Mustang. But if it's going to be something just as a fun car, then I think the C7 would probably be a little bit more fun than uh, a Mustang GT personally. Um, but yeah, uh, Dave J says, uh, Mustang 2.3 2020 review. Uh, I really was hoping to review the, uh, the new EcoBoost high performance. I haven't had an opportunity yet. Um, didn't get an invite from Ford for that launch. So, um, I'm not sure when that's coming. I even have asked, uh, cause I do get some Ford press vehicles and I asked the press fleet, they don't have any EcoBoost Mustangs. Um, so I've been wanting to do one ever since the 2018s had that little bump in power, um, but haven't had a chance to review one. So if there's anyone out there who has a new EcoBoost, uh, it's nearby, uh, feel free to send me an email and, uh, you know, would love to review one for sure. I'm going to get a drink here real quick while I look for the next question. Brad says, do you plan to keep the Mustang until you're an old man? Is it your slice of history vehicle? Um, yeah, I do actually want to keep uh, the bullet my entire life. It's a car I'd love to pass down to my future kids and all that kind of stuff. Um, I want to keep, even if I couldn't drive that car, even if it got illegal to drive because it's, you know, a gasoline powered vehicle in some dystopian future where you're not allowed to drive that stuff. Um, I still would just keep it just because I love it so much. It's Every single time I get in that vehicle, I was just telling my wife uh, yesterday how much I love driving that bullet still. I mean, it always just sounds so good. It's just so much fun. I just, I love everything about that car. It's, I've never loved a car as much as the bullet as far as a car I've owned. Uh, it's just fantastic. And speaking of that, uh, Joe 4G63 says, what do you miss more, the Legacy or the BRZ? Between those two, um, I probably miss them equally. I really love the BRZ, but as I was getting towards the end of my ownership with it, it um, there were some things. I was just kind of getting tired of a, a few things in it, and um, so that was something that I think if I would have kept the B, if I would have been able to keep the BRZ, you know, I probably would have 
um, made some changes to it uh, just to kind of, I probably would have gotten a quieter exhaust on it because the loud exhaust kind of was getting old and I, I desperately just wanted it to have more power. Um, the Legacy, I never had any of those complaints. It sounded great. I, I, you know, it had plenty of power. It went everywhere. And honestly, I, I owned the Legacy a lot longer. I had that vehicle for about five years versus uh, about two or so for the BRZ. So I think honestly, I miss the Legacy more, uh, especially since I don't know where the BRZ is at. Um, I wasn't able to follow along. That's had a couple of owners since, uh, since I had it. But the legacy, um, I do know the owner and I follow her on Instagram. And so every once in a while, she doesn't post a lot about it, but every once in a while she'll post a picture of it. And that just uh, brings back all the feelings for that car as well. So I think I miss the legacy more. Um, Eric here says, Matt, please tell us what is your attainable dream car and what uh, is your if money were no object dream car? So uh, attainable dream car um, is probably a uh, used Jaguar F-Type. That's kind of my goal. That's one of my cars that I'm hoping to add here in the next uh, couple of years, maybe a little bit sooner, depending on how the channel goes. Again, this is my full-time career, so it all depends on how well the videos do and stuff. But um, I'd love to own an F-Type. And the used ones are getting you know, pretty affordable now. You can even get some pretty nice ones for around 40 grand, um, which to me is a bargain for a car that you know most of them were 80, 90 grand new. Um, so F-Type for the attainable one. If money were no object dream car, there are so many. Um, <laughs> I have like a lottery dream list of cars that I would have. I would probably own like 14 or 15 cars if money were no object. But if I could only have one, I would probably pick the new Ferrari 812 GTS, which is the convertible version of the um, A12 super fast, you know, the V12. Having that V12 sound with no roof and those fantastic Ferrari looks, that's uh, definitely my my ultimate dream car currently. Now, if I had tons of money, I would probably also have some crazier stuff than that. Um, but if I could only have one, that would probably be it. Um, other questions here. Um, so Mark Noble, he uh, commented here a little bit ago. And thanks. He's always the one who uh, stops in on the weekly updates every Friday. And I really appreciate you stopping in, I believe, from, from Germany. So thank you so much for watching. He says, do you plan uh, to travel to Europe in the future? Um, so I did actually travel to Europe um, both la last year we went to the UK. And this year, uh, my wife and I went to France. And uh, we went to Paris. And then we went to the south of France and hung out around there. And uh, so it was, it was really beautiful. And I didn't really post about it because it was just a, a personal trip and, uh, you know, something that just my wife and I uh, did. And it was it was fantastic. Um, I love Europe. It's it's great. Uh, I think, um, you know, there's still so much more that we'd love to see. But I think we've we've really loved London the most. That was uh really fun. We'd love to go back there uh, some more, but we'd also love to, you know, see more of uh, France and, and Italy as well. Cause uh, I do have some like great grandparents and stuff from Italy. So it'd be cool to go there uh, and a few other places, but no plans currently to do any other Europe trips. I cashed in all my frequent flyer miles. And so <laughs> don't have any uh, way to afford another Europe trip anytime soon, but hopefully someday. Um, other questions here? Uh, oh, Newt Media, thank you for joining in. He's uh, also helping with moderating here. Um, and he also is the one who did the awesome pictures of my bullet last year when I first got it. So definitely check out his Instagram page if you want to see some uh, great automotive photography. But he says, London's a great city. I agree. I, I love it. If I, I couldn't live in America, if I couldn't live in America, I'd probably move to London. That's how much I love it. It's, it's fantastic there. Um, uh, Sonic Boom says, is Beth going to review her Benz? She is. Uh, that is going to be happening probably this month sometime. Um, now that, you know, I was waiting for the uh, the ceramic coating to be done, which, uh, you know, we just did, and uh, the window tint. So now it's looking really, really good. And so it's ready to be reviewed. So um, that's going to be happening hopefully sometime this month. But excuse me. Yeah. So look for that pretty soon. Um Eric says, do you think the Veloster N will hold up in value, really considering one? Um, that's hard to say because, uh, you know, Hyundai's historically haven't been great, but they are getting better with their, with their uh, resale value. So um, I don't think, I mean, unless you're planning on flipping it, I wouldn't, you know, let that dissuade you from getting a Veloster N. They're so fantastic. And I do think, you know, there's not a ton of them around. Um, and you know, I don't know, we'll have to see how many end models that, uh, Hyundai comes out with, but 
Um, I think it's it's worth the price that even if you take a hit on depreciation, um, I think it would be worth it because that is another car. If you can't go for a Miata, I think the Veloster N is uh, also one of the most fun cars you can get for around $30,000. So then um, I actually, I have a video coming. I'm not sure exactly when, um, but I have a video coming um, comparing the 2019 Miata to the Veloster N. And uh, I actually did that video with Engineering Explained. And so I'm waiting. Um, we kind of did a collab, uh, me and him. And so we're, I'm waiting until his video gets posted. And whenever he posts that, then I'll be posting mine to go along with that. And I'm not sure when that's happening yet, but there will be a comparison video between those two down the road. Um, L8 Apex says, uh, are you, late Apex says, uh, are you going to be doing uh, any exhaust work on your bullet? I've just put the Corsa double helix resonator delete on my GT350 and it sounds amazing. Um, I don't want to do any exhaust to the bullet because I love the way it sounds already. It has that four mode exhaust and so I can have it as quiet or as loud as I want. I love the tone already. I love the way that it sounds. And so to me, there's no reason to change it on the bullet. Um, but that's just my personal uh, you know, feelings on that. But uh, John King here says, uh, how do you feel about the Gladiator? Do you think FCA has plans to produce more with other options like a diesel? And you think it's worth retail? Um, the Gladiator... I loved it. So I did a review and then I also did a week long video in it. So you can hear all my thoughts on the gladiator there. Um, as far as FCA's plans, you know how FCA, they keep things fresh. They're always having new additions and new um, additions as well as additions. And so there's all kinds of things I'm sure in the pipeline for the Gladiator. Um, I'm not sure. I think, you know, there's, it's been going back and forth with the diesel thing about whether or not it's happening. Um, I think they are doing it though, last I heard, um, but I'm not 100% on that. Um, but I think that is something that would make a lot of sense for the Gladiator. Um, as far as whether it's worth the retail price, if you off-road 100%, it's by far the best off-roading truck. And if you actually do legit off-roading, Gladiator is going to be the best truck, hands down. If you don't do a lot of off-roading, um, then I would say that it is, you know, a very expensive mid-sized truck. You can get a full-size Ram that is basically very well loaded for the same money. Um, you know, so I think when it comes down to something like that, I would much rather have a Ram personally because I don't do off-roading. But if you do value the off-road capability, then the Gladiator is awesome. Um, Terry says, how do you enjoy a rear-wheel drive car in the winter? Um, so like I mentioned a little bit earlier in the past, I put snow tires on the Mustangs and they were fine. The Bullet, I keep the summer tires on it so I do not drive it uh, whenever it's really cold or wet out. Um, but, uh, if it's 40 degrees or near there, I will take it out in the winter time and that's it. Um, but yeah, it's, uh, it's definitely can be fun. You just have to know what you're doing. If you know how to, you know, manage oversteer and sliding in a rear wheel drive car and you're not starting on Hills constantly, then it's fine. Um, so yeah, I wouldn't, you know, I think if you just have the right tire set up, you're good to go with a rear wheel drive car in the snow. Um, other stuff here, um, let's see, we got... Um, Lucas says, how do you get along with the other guys or how did you get along with the other guys on the super launch? That was a fantastic launch. That whole event was set up so well. It made it so easy to uh, get a really good video made. Um, and it was so awesome. I mean, there's so many of us as that dude in blue and, um, you know, Redline reviews. There's just so many of us all together. It was so much fun. Um, and, uh, yeah, that was fantastic. And also, you know, engineering explained was my driving partner. So me and Jason were uh, cruising around in the super all day, just cracking up at the crackles and pops from the exhaust and stuff. It was, it was a fantastic, uh, thing. And so, yeah, it was really cool to, to, uh, get along with, everyone and you know kind of hang out with everyone even like savage geese i'd never met him before got to meet him there got to meet uh kind of meet matt fair for the second time he was there as well um got to hang out with all those guys it was it was fantastic so kyle was there too i hadn't seen him in a little bit it was great to hang out we all get along really well and it's it's um really fun so uh new media here is also saying i think subaru should do some kind of ridgeline competitor as a newer baja but use the ascent chassis that's a really good idea. And I think that Hyundai is kind of uh, considering something similar. You know, they're talking about a Tucson based unibody truck to compete with the Ridgeline. The problem is the Ridgeline isn't a hot market. You know, the Ridgeline already has some struggles and it's, um, you know, a lot of people don't think of it as a real truck, even though it does most of the real truck stuff that 90% of truck buyers actually do. Um, but I think it's an uphill battle for Honda. And so I think a lot of the other car companies that are thinking about getting into that industry or that segment are kind of watching from the sidelines and watching Honda, you know, take all the abuse. And I mean, Honda's doing decently well for themselves with the Ridgeline, but I think that that truck just, 
um, has way more hate than it deserves. And I think when other car companies see that, they're like, well, what's the point? You know, everyone's going to go buy an F-150 anyway. So like, why are we even trying? And so they just focus on the stuff that they're strong in instead. So um, yeah, that's, uh, I think why, but I mean, you know, they do have the, all the pieces, they could do something like a newer Baja. And I think that would be a very cool idea. Um, late apex says, would you recommend Michelin super sports or PS four S for a three season car? Like your bullet. I'm currently on cup twos and they're sketchy in the rain. Yeah. I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to have cup twos personally, if you're driving in the rain. Um, so super store super sports is just basically the older version of the PS 4 S that the PS 4 S was supposed to be the replacement for the super sports. Um, and so I think because of that, the PS 4 S has more developments and it's newer tech than the super sports. So the PS 4 S is better in the rain. So if you're looking for a three season tire, like the bullet, I hundred percent would say go for the PS 4 S. Um, if you want something you can actually drive below 40 degrees, the Michelin pilot sport all season is also fantastic. From what I've heard, I have a, actually someone who, when he first got his bullet swapped over to the all season version of the pilot, uh, or, you know, the Michelin sport 4 S. And, um, he said there's very little difference. Um, and you have that four season capability. It's obviously still not great in the snow, but you could get by. And as long as you're not driving through, actual snow you can actually drive it all four seasons with those um so it just depends on how much performance you want but if you you know just looking for three seasons a ps4s uh, would be the way to go in my opinion um silver flamingo says matt you're putting rims on the bullet i am not i love the stock wheels i think they're perfect and uh, i know there's others that have changed the wheels on their bullet and that's fine but for me you couldn't pay me to put different wheels on the bullet i love the wheels on that um md shamir says do you always drive hard i actually very rarely drive hard i drive hard in the videos and uh, obviously for fun every once in a while a little bit but um you know, most of the time I'm just cruising around running errands and things like that. So I, most of the time actually probably drive very slowly <laughs> and very much, uh, just like everyone else is, you know, stuck behind traffic and, um, not able to, you know, have too much fun. Um, but that's why having a good sounding exhaust is super important to me because even when I'm doing 25, I still hear the purr of a beautiful V8. And so, um, that makes it a little more bearable whenever you're behind slow people in traffic and stuff. Um, other questions here. Uh, we have Zachary Jones says, what do you think of the McLaren F1? It was the single greatest car ever manufactured of the 21st or 20th century. Um, uh, the McLaren F1 is amazing. And I think it was uh, very cutting edge for the time. And, um, you know, even still is a very, very impressive car. Um, you know, I, it's, I don't know if I would say it's the best car of the 20th century. In my opinion, I don't know what the best car would be, but, um, I think, you know, to me, I would want to pick a car that actually has a little bit more of a broader appeal. Um, but I think as far as history goes, you know, it's going to be one of the highest performing vehicles, obviously, of 20th century. And so for that reason, it's one of the greatest. Um, and I, I'm actually really curious, you know, Gordon Murray, who designed the McLaren F1, and he's working on a new uh, supercar and sports car. And I'm really curious to see if he can kind of get some of that magic back for his new car. That would be very impressive. So we'll have to see. Um, KDB2 says Accord 1.5T manual, or is the 2.0 the way to go? Um, so the 2.0T, I have not driven the manual version of that, so I can't weigh in on that, unfortunately. But um, as far as the 2.0 motor uh, goes, obviously it depends how much power you want. I think the 2.0 is great, but I did hear from a few people that you don't you don't have the limit slip differential in the 2.0T manual. So um, as far as putting power down, it's a little more of a struggle than it is in something like the Civic Type R that has that limited slip diff. And so uh, that's the only thing I've really heard. But as far as you know which one to get, you know, if you have the disposable money to go up to the 2.0 T, I still think that's the way to go, especially if you're going for that sport trim, because the sport trim of the 2.0 T gives you heated seats and satellite radio, which you don't get in the 1.5 T with the manual sport. So the 1.5 T manual is based on the base model accord versus the 2.0 T manual is actually based on the EX trim. So that's why you get a couple of those extra features uh, which is something they don't really publicize and you have to really pay attention to notice those differences. But so if you want heated seats or satellite radio, go for the 2.0 T as well. Um, so Joe says, do you like the 991.2 GT3 Touring? I think it's a fantastic car. I'd love to drive one someday. I actually had an offer to review one. Um, I think up in, uh, Canada and, uh, just never got a chance to get up there to review it, but I would definitely love to review one someday. Um, TC says, are you going to review a 2019 Hyundai Elantra GT N line? 
Um, I am hoping to review one of those soon. Um, I'm not sure I don't have anything scheduled as far as press vehicles for one of those, uh, but I did do the standard Elantra GT, which should drive pretty similarly. Uh, but uh, I am curious to see what the N-line changes, you know, made as far as driving dynamics and stuff. Um, MD Shamir says, favorite engine that would go to the Ferrari V12, the new current uh, one. I think that is my favorite engine. It sounds fantastic. It revs super high. It's tons of power. Just all around an all-star in my opinion. Um, we have another question here. Uh, John Patrick King says, what is in your opinion, the safest car brand offered in the U S Subaru, Toyota, Honda, etc." I think probably Volvo, right? You know, they always are one of the top brands as far as over-engineering cars to be very safe. And um, so I think, if you want safety above all else, Volvo is probably the way to go. Otherwise, I think Subaru is probably towards the top. But all of, honestly, I mean, Subaru, Toyota, Honda, all of those are very good. Most of them do IIHS Top Safety Pick Plus awards are very close to it. Um, you know, same with Hyundai and Kia. All of those, I think, are really, really good uh, brands as far as safety goes. Um, uh, we have TC says, do you have a least favorite car brand? Um I don't know. I'm trying to think of a brand that I really don't like. Um, I didn't like smart cars and they've already been killed off now. So that's kind of a moot point. Um, but otherwise I'm trying to think, I can't think of anything off the top of my head that I really hate, but uh, if something comes to me, I'll let you know. Um, Newt Media here asks uh, G37 S or 370Z can't decide. Uh, the 370Z is a little bit more, I think the wheelbase is a little bit longer. It's a little bit easier to drive because the 370Z can have a little bit of snap over steer and that makes it a little bit trickier in the rain and stuff. It's also got a lot more tire noise and less refinement than the G G37. So um, if you don't care about, uh, you know, the extra weight of the G37, personally, I prefer it. Um, the 370 is also fantastic as long as you don't care about, you know, the refinement and the comfort and that kind of stuff. Cause it just isn't as strong in the 370. Um, we have, uh, Mark says, um, maybe the new parking function, I guess I'm missing the little thread going on here. <laughs> Sorry. Um, we have, uh, but you JW gaming says I've seen a Tesla model X on Copart with a steering wheel touching the roof. Um, yeah, I th so Tesla is also a very safe brand too. Getting back to that, I guess is what you guys are talking about. So yeah, the I think in Tesla, you know, Elon Musk likes to claim that they're the safest brand in a lot of ways, and they probably are. Um, but uh, you know, then you hear about batteries, you know, exploding, and I know car uh, tanks also explode with gas and stuff. But um, you know, I think Tesla you know, they're pretty solid vehicles, and the extra weight helps. But um, yeah, I don't know enough about it to really weigh in on Tesla safety. Um, Zachary Jones says thoughts on Nissan as a brand. Um, I think Nissan is a good brand, but I think they kind of, uh, they're not at the top of their game right now. I think their CVT is, uh, probably one of the worst in the industry still. Um, and their product lineup is just pretty stale. Um, you know, I think it just, I'm looking forward to, again, hopefully having a new Z, but the GTR is still pretty old. Um, and other stuff, they're just kind of missing the mark, I think. You know, like the Nissan Maxima I reviewed, like it was good, but it was just overly soft and, uh, you know, just steering wasn't great. The CVT wasn't great. And, you know, for a vehicle that they market as their, excuse me, sports sedan, it just, you know, wasn't as sporty as I think most people would expect. Um, you know, it just, I don't know, I think Nissan kind of went for, you know, the, the masses and kind of just chasing volume and they do very good volume still, even though they are slightly down this year, you know, they're still selling a ton of cars. And so that's just a choice they made, but I think they kind of turned their back on the enthusiast community in some ways. I mean, they do still, you know, have the 370Z around and uh, the GTR is fantastic, but I just wish they had, you know, another Sentra SER or Sentra Nismo. And I wish that they did Nismo versions of the Ultima and stuff that actually had more power. I mean, they have a lot of good building blocks, you know, like put the turbo motor in the Ultima with the all-wheel drive. Currently it's either one or the other. Put those two together in a Nismo trim, give it a sportier suspension setup, and maybe boost the turbo a little bit more and boom, you have an awesome car and give it a real automatic transmission and you're set, but they just, you know, they they just don't want to do it. So, um, you know, unfortunately everything's just kind of going to other, other brands instead. 
Um, other stuff here, we have that Washington it says, what is your all-time favorite Subaru? I think the 22B is uh, my favorite for sure. After that, I think it would be the 2002 WRX, the, the Bug Eye version is also fantastic. Um, the kind of the first uh, WRX I ever fell in love with. Um, other stuff, uh, Late Apex says, favorite sports car you've reviewed this year? Um, favorite car this year? Mm, probably, honestly, probably the Supra. That's probably it. It's so much fun. Fantastic car. Um, Adnan says 1.5 T Accord manual over focus ST for daily driving, spirited driving on weekends. Um, I probably think the focus ST is going to be more fun. You just have way more power in the focus ST. It's actually set up to be a little bit sportier. And so for those reasons, I would probably go for the focus ST. Um, Donald Trump says off topic of cars. What do you think of the new Joker movie? I know you like the dark Knights, as do I. Uh, so what do you think about, uh, Phoenix taking over Ledger's uh, legacy? Um, so I've not seen it yet. I'm hoping to see it very soon. Um, and, uh, I'm very curious that it looks so promising from the trailer and stuff. So I'm excited to see it. I think so far, I mean, it's, it looks really, really good. So, you know, obviously Suicide Squad and stuff, the Joker in that was good. Um, but I personally think this one should be, should be better. And, um, actually my wife texted me, we are officially seeing the Joker movie tonight. So, uh, uh, yeah, that's going to be exciting. I'm looking forward to seeing it and, um, yeah, should be good. I'm sure. And, uh, I don't, I haven't seen the reviews, but I think I heard the reviews are actually really, really good. So I'm, I'm glad I hope it, it does well. Cause I think, um, you know, the whole DC universe really needs a hit because it's been a while and they've kind of struggled, you know, Warner brothers doing another, you know, really good Batman movie and stuff. So I'm hoping this is the start of a new page. That's going to be, you know, really good for them. But, um, we have other questions here. Um, you JW gaming says, Matt, have you ever thought of starting a gaming channel? Maybe once a week, would you have time? Do you play games? Um, I haven't really thought about starting that just because there's so many people that do that already that it, I feel like it's kind of hard to stand out in that segment. But I mean, it'd be something, you know, that I can, it, I've considered it. And I mean, you know, I, I, probably once a week, I could probably find some time to do something like that. Um, you know, I don't, I haven't really played Xbox in a while. I, I play Xbox one whenever I have time, but it's like, it's been a long time since I've played through a game. It's usually during the winter time is when I have more time. So I was playing Forza Horizon four for a while over the winter. I was also uh, playing Mafia three uh, last year and loved that and played through that. Um, I love Ellie Noir, so I played the remaster of that when that came out on Xbox One. Um, as far as other like racing games, I got into Forza 7 a little bit, uh, but then just ran out of time with that. And uh, what else? I mean, GTA I've played, and uh, that was fun, um, but that's that's about it. So uh, I do play a little bit, but um, there are some interesting games coming out. Honestly, I was kind of intrigued by the new Need for Speed game because I used to be super into the Need for Speed games back in the day, but it's been a while since I've played one of those. But you know, that would be something um, interesting to, to try out as well. Um, that washer nerd says, how do you become an auto journalist? And how does an individual become an auto journalist? So, I mean, obviously if you want to go the traditional route, you go to college for journalism and, um, then kind of work your way up the ranks at magazines or whatever. But with YouTube now, of course, there's no barrier to entry. So anyone with a camera can, you know, put up a, a video of a review and, you know, see how it goes. And that's how I got started was, um, you know, I always wanted to be a journalist, but, um, whenever I was shopping for majors in college, YouTube didn't monetize videos yet. And there was no way to make this your career. So it was literally, I'm doing a job that didn't exist 10 years ago. And so I didn't have that option. So I went to school for financial planning, got my four year degree from Virginia tech. And then, um, after that, you know, that was like 2012 is when I graduated. And that was, I had a couple of friends that had started monetizing stuff and they were in the partner program. And I was like, wow, you can actually make money off of this. And that was always my passion. I wanted to review cars, but um, to me, I didn't want to work for a magazine because I just heard it was a tough job to get back then. There's very little turnover back then. And, uh, you know, even people who did work in magazines weren't making very much money. And so I was like, well, I don't want to be driving awesome cars and then be starving on, you know, the daily grind and not having, uh, you know, good, good paying career. So that's kind of why I went into finance because I wanted to have something that, you know, was decent paying. And then, um, you know, just with, uh, as things progressed with YouTube, I was able to just, I was like, well, I was, at that point I was still living with my parents. 
I had nothing to lose. I was like, well, I'm just going to try my dream. And if it doesn't work out, I can always fall back on my finance degree. Um, so I just did the, the channel and um, thankfully it just kind of uh, snowballed from there and kind of took off. And, um, you know, that's, that's how I became an auto journalist is I just started talking about cars in front of a camera. And, you know, now I've gotten to the point where I've reviewed, I don't know, 300, 400 cars or whatever. And so I have enough experience that it actually gives me a little bit more insight um, and I think that's kind of, uh, what helps me, you know, now. And I think that's why it's, it's a little tough, you know, there's so many people now that do YouTube reviews back when I was doing them, there's very few people doing it. It was still a pretty new thing. And so now it's, it's tough to stand out unless you really have fantastic quality video and people love your personality and stuff. There are, are still, you know, new channels that pop up all the time that really blow up, but it's, it's a lot tougher than it used to be for sure. Um, other things here. Um, TC says, what do you think about purchasing cars through online stuff like Carvana and Vroom? Um, actually, uh, it seems to be pretty cool. So I've actually, my father-in-law traded in his car through Carvana. I think I talked to one or two people who have bought cars from Carvana and it's, uh, seems to be pretty, pretty nice. It's pretty seamless, pretty painless, easy. Um, and, uh, yeah, I think it could be the future of car sales if, if they could overcome the hurdle of the dealerships, you know, the dealership associations have such a stronghold on that whole segment. They're trying to do anything new in that segment is really, really tough because they know that if that door gets opened up, um, you know, most of these dealers are just going to get killed with, uh, cause no one wants to deal with salesmen. No one wants to deal with all that kind of stuff. So if you can avoid that whole thing, I think most people would prefer that. And so I think Carvana is going to be really be the future of car sales in a lot of ways. Um, and uh, so a couple other questions here. Um, Lucas says, you have a problem with hitting the top of your head on the ceiling in the back seats of sports cars. I'm six feet and I can't fit in the back of a BRZ M235i and Mustangs. Um, so I'm 5'9". So uh, yeah, I I fit pretty well in the back of most sports car back seats. Um, so I don't really have too much of a problem with that. But then I really don't encounter that a whole lot other than when I'm doing a review on those cars. But Otherwise, I never you know, have to sit in the back of any kind of sports car usually. So it's not a real problem for me. But, uh, you know, that's just all comes down to the design of the car and, you know, what the um, car company is going for. So, um, but yeah, not I think that's kind of a problem. Most people don't worry about too much. Um, other stuff, funny man or family man's garage says, love your channel, brother. My turbo odyssey is ready for you to review. Are you interested in doing a review on it? I'm in Louisiana, but could make the trip have family in Washington. That's awesome. I appreciate the offer. Send me an email and I can uh, kind of look into it. I usually try and review mostly stock vehicles um, just because, you know, I do these reviews as uh, consumer advice and I want to help people find the car that's, you know, right for them and a car they're going to love and enjoy. And so when you modify stuff, then it's like just that car. And so um, it's not an accurate portrayal for other people. So it's a fun video. And that's why often I do like quick drive videos on modified cars instead. A little bit of a shorter thing where I just do a couple acceleration pulls, talk about the mods, and that's it. But as far as doing a full review on it, um, that's something I probably, uh, since there's not a lot of appeal there, it's something I wouldn't want to do a full review on. But definitely send me an email and we can talk more about that. Uh, I have all the contact info in the description below there. And I appreciate the offer for sure. Um, Michael says, are you heading out to LA this year for the auto show? I'm not. Um, so yeah, auto shows, I mentioned this a little bit earlier as well. But auto shows, um, those videos don't do very well for me views wise. And so um, I can't justify the expenses of flying all the way to LA, staying at expensive LA hotels during the auto show time uh, if the videos hardly get any views. So um, that's just the honest truth of it. So uh, I'm not going to LA for that reason as much as I would enjoy going. Um, I just can't justify it from a business expense kind of standpoint. Um, Jimmy says, would you like Alpine A110S to come to the U.S.? Narrow tires and good power to weight ratio. Absolutely. The A10S uh, seems to be fantastic. Uh, it looks amazing. And all the reviews I've seen on like the Grand Tour and Chris Harris and stuff, you know, they all have loved it. And I think it's it sounds like a great recipe. And uh, I'd love to review one someday. But yeah, I would love for those to come to the States. It's a bummer they don't. 
Um, Central Intelligence Agency says, what makes you most happy? Uh, my bullet is right up there as uh, one of the things car related that uh, makes me the most happy. Obviously, you know, my family, my wife, all those uh, make me very happy as well. Um, but yeah, I don't really have a whole lot of other hobbies or anything like that. It's mostly just the cars. And so uh, that's why I love the bullet. It's just, you know, one of the things I get in it and it puts a smile on my face every time I drive it. It's just the best. Um, other things here, uh, Fatuzzi says, Matt, what's the quickest car you've ever driven? Um, so, you know, I just did that thousand horsepower Mustang. That was probably pretty quick. Obviously I've done like the Dodge Demon and stuff like that. I think the quickest car probably would have been the McLaren 720S I reviewed. I'm thinking was the fastest and that was crazy, crazy fast. Those are so much fun. Um, and yeah, definitely go watch that video if you want a crazy reaction. If you haven't seen that one yet, um, that's probably the fastest thing I've ever driven. Um, Zachary Jones says, thoughts on this Chevy Cruze. My sister has a 2018 in bright red and her fuel economy was impressive because we did a road trip from Memphis, Tennessee to Illinois and she got 53 miles per gallon. Wow, that is impressive. That's, wow, that's way, way more than they're usually rated at. That's awesome. Um, so the Chevy Cruze is a solid, uh, you know, economy kind of small car setup. I did a review on a Cruze. I think it was a 17 or a 16 maybe that I did. Um, but I think it was, it was a solid, uh, you know, car for its class. I think it's just that class of car is so competitive. I think I still prefer the way the Honda Civic and the Corolla and stuff like that uh, drive. But I do like the Chevy was one of the first to have the Apple CarPlay integration and stuff, which is awesome. Um, and uh, I do like that they even did like the hatchback with the manual for a little while there and stuff, which was cool. But um, yeah, they're they're nice uh, cars. You know, they seem to be pretty reliable and stuff as well. But I, I personally think the imports still have them beat as far as that segment goes. And it's a shame though the cruise is getting killed off because I think it was a really great car. Um, Jay J Man says, uh, "Will you do another video with Mike from Street Speed Seven One Seven? Um, I'm looking forward to hopefully doing some more videos with him in the future. We don't have anything planned yet, but uh, you know he's always getting new cars in and stuff. So maybe I'll have a chance to review one of his new cars. It's uh, you know just a matter of." arranging the trip and you know obviously he's very busy with everything going on as well so um but yeah i'm hoping to you know meet up with him at some point here probably i probably won't have time this year but maybe you know sometime in the spring would be cool to meet up again but uh yeah he's he's an awesome guy and i'm glad to see that he's still doing well um other stuff here we have uh girish says uh, you think stick cars will be around when you teach your kid to drive you may have to hurry up brother <laughs> yeah i know well yeah we'll have to see um, how that, how that all pans out. Um, definitely want to have kids, uh, you know, fairly soon. So we'll see. But uh, as far as uh, the manual, um, you know, there's always the used market. That's the thing that I try and, you know, remind people of is, you know, people still ride horses around. And even if the manual goes the way of the horse, as far as normal transportation and, and stuff, there's still going to be some out there. And I think that there's going to, you know, be a core base of people that always drive manuals. So I think that that's uh, safe ish in a way, you know? And so really the only way that manuals would ever go away hundred percent, I think is if they made it illegal for people to have gasoline cars on the streets. And if that were the case, then obviously you can't really have a manual electric car, at least that I've seen yet. So um, that would be the only way. But otherwise, you know, like I said, I plan to keep my bullet my entire life. So if nothing else, I can tow my bullet to a track and teach my kids how to drive stick there and, uh, you know, do it that way. But uh, hopefully they'll, you know, they'll still be some type of fun gasoline powered cars with manuals. Uh, you know, even if it's in limited uses, you can use them for hopefully, you know, in 20 years or so we'll have to see. Um, other questions here we have racer X says, I like horses. One of my favorite animals. Horses are great. Um, I have been, I've ridden horses a couple of times. They're a lot of fun. Um, other stuff. Uh, we have son of Tamriel says, be cool to see you hang out with Hoovy too. I'm always up for collabs with just about anyone. You know, most of the car community is pretty cool and easy to get along with. Uh, so always up for collabs. Um, Smile from Alice says, if Toyota offers the new Supra with a manual, would you be tempted to get one in the future? Honestly, the uh, automatic and the Supra wouldn't stop me from getting it. I think the thing that stops me from getting the Supra, aside from the fact that I have the bullet, um, if the bullet didn't exist or if you know, every bullet in existence disappeared and I had to buy something else. Um, I would totally go for the Supra. The only thing I don't love about the Supra is the BMW iDrive system. Honestly, I wish that Toyota um, just kind of put a Corolla interior in the Supra 
and had a normal touchscreen and just a simple infotainment system and charged five or 10 grand less for it with just a base, you know, brand new coral interior, still a pretty nice place to be. Honestly, I think uh, that would have been the way I would have done it personally. And, um, but yeah, so I'm not in love with BMW's iDrive system. It's just a little bit annoying to me. So that's the only thing that kind of would prevent me from getting a super, but I don't think that would be a deal breaker. Um, and so if for some reason I couldn't have a bullet, uh, I think I would still probably, I think super would probably still be my top pick for other vehicle I would have instead. Um, other stuff here. AJ says, any details you can share on the upcoming 2021 F-150? I haven't heard anything at all about the new F-150. I don't even know if there is a next-gen version in development yet. Um, I think it's the best-selling truck, and they continue to refine it. And so the only new thing I know that's I've heard this coming is, you know, a GT500-powered um, version of the Raptor, and that's going to be probably a 2021 model, maybe 2020, I don't know. We'll have to see, but, um, something around there. And, uh, otherwise, you know, they know the, the electric one, electric one's coming hybrid ones coming, I think as well. So there's all that kind of stuff, but I don't really have any info on, uh, any other new stuff for the F-150. Um, UJW gaming says, Matt, do you know, Matt from Carwell? I think you should meet him. I've never met him. Um, yeah, they do crazy views on their videos though. So they got a good thing going there. Um, and he's a very exciting presenter. So, uh, yeah, it'd be cool to meet him someday. Um, other things here, uh, we have, um, Zachary Jones says thoughts on the 2009 Pontiac Grand Prix GXP with the 5.3 LS3 V8 with 303 horsepower and 325 pound feet of torque. Uh, does zero to 60 and 5.7 and a top speed of, uh, 143. Yeah. Um, I've never driven one of those, but, um, they were a good combo What they, you know, it's a it's very solid, obviously the LS three is a bulletproof motor. And so, yeah, those are um, pretty cool, but I've never driven one. That's a vehicle I'd love to review though. Uh, to Chang, thank you for the super chat. I really appreciate that. Uh, he says, what's your take on the cannonball run? Vin wiki, LOL. Honestly, I uh, I must be out of the loop on that. I don't know anything about that. I mean, I think I've seen, you know, VinWiki obviously has their YouTube channel, and I've heard about the Cannonball, Cannonball Run stuff in the past, but I don't haven't heard about any of the new stuff, so I can't weigh in on that, unfortunately. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, it's so tough keeping up with everything in the car world because I don't have time to watch all these videos that all these channels are posting. There's so many these days. Uh, Sonic Boom says, you're going to see Ford versus Ferrari. I would like to see it. Um, don't have any plans to yet, but I'm hoping to catch it while it's in theaters for sure. Uh, it seems seems pretty cool, but I'm not rushing off to see it either. Um, but it seems I'm glad they're doing a racing movie. It's just very hard to make racing movies with broad appeal, so I'm worried it's going to bomb at the box office, but we'll have to wait and see. Um, Fatuzzi says, if you weren't a car journalist, what would you be doing? That's a very good question. Um <laughs> I don't know, honestly, there's, I mean, I have a few like plan B's, I guess, if you know, the YouTube channel, um, you know, came to an end uh, someday, but as far as what I would choose to do, I don't know. There's so many things. And, um, you know, some of you that have been following the channel for a long time, you know, that I love movies and I love the movie business. And I, it was an extra in a lot of movies, uh, several years back. And, uh, I still probably should do a little vlog because I know some of you wanted to see a vlog me, of me talking about all the movies I've been in and stuff. So that's something that I would, uh, you know, probably, I'd probably go towards the movie business. There's a lot of um, jobs within the movie industry that I think I would be very good at. And I think aside from cars, being on a movie set is really the only other place where I have as much of an adrenaline rush as I do when I'm reviewing cars, especially fast cars. Being on a movie set is like so exciting to me that I think I would probably try and get into the movie business in some form or another, you know, wouldn't, I probably wouldn't get into acting, even though I enjoy acting. It's just such a tough you know, thing to get into, but it, I would just love to do some of the behind the scenes coordination stuff, things like that. You know, maybe something um, with that related to cars, you know, kind of tie in, you know, like being a vehicle manager for movies or something like that would be cool. Um, but I don't know, honestly, um, we'll have to see what happens. I have no clue what the future holds. You know, I don't know where I'll be in five years. Hope I'll still be doing this channel, but you know, you never know with YouTube, uh, they can make one change and all of a sudden everything, uh, 
you know, can be completely ruined. So you never know with YouTube. It's uh, very, very scary sometimes. Um, but Italian Nice 678, thank you so much for the super chat. I really appreciate that. He says, hey, Matt, have you ever driven slash reviewed an Integra? It's my favorite car of all time. They are fantastic cars. I briefly drove them um, just whenever I used to work at a car dealership when I was a teenager. Um, but other than that, I've never driven one or reviewed one. Um, but they are appreciating. I don't know if you saw um, how they um, bring a trailer. There was a Type R, a 1999 Type R that went for $82,000 for an Integra. So clearly, you know, you're not the only person that uh, thinks that's their favorite car of all time. There's people paying serious money for really nice Integras nowadays. So, um, yeah, that is uh, going to be a very interesting market to watch. But, uh, yeah, that's a... Uh, that's a very awesome car. I'd love to review an Integra. I've never gotten an opportunity. No one's ever offered one to me, um, but I would love to review one for sure someday. Uh, Barry Harris Jr. says, Sup, Matt. Love your channel. Ever since way back to Super Rooks fan. Keep up the great work, but what is your take on the S209 STI? Um, they seem really cool. You know, I did a little walk around video at the New York Auto Show when they revealed it. Um, haven't driven one obviously yet or had a chance to, you know, review one or anything, but, um, I would love to, they seem cool. I love how they have the intercooler sprayer. It comes, they, they brought back and that has like the little, uh, paddles behind the wheel for that. That is really cool. Um, I wish it wasn't so rare and I wish it wasn't so expensive. Um, but I think it's, it's very cool and probably will be the ultimate Subaru, um, for a good while. And so, uh, yeah, those are awesome. And like I said, I hope to drive one someday. Um, Zachary says thoughts on the refresh 2020 Chevy Malibu 2.0 T premiere. I recently watched a review on it and it was a nice improvement. Yeah, I'd be curious to, to check out the new Malibu. You know, I, I did, I think it was a 2017 or 2018. I wasn't in love with that. It was a little soft, but, you know, a lot of people really appreciate the softness of that, especially if you're daily driving it. And so, um, you know, that's something I would uh, be worth checking out, doing a little update video on to see what they're like. But, uh, yeah, I haven't checked out the 2020s yet personally. Um other questions here, we have uh, Cruising RSX says, Honda Fit news. Um, yeah, there's, you know, we, knew a new, we know a new Honda Fit is coming to the Tokyo Motor Show here at the end of this month, and um, I believe it's coming to the United States, but I don't think that's a guarantee yet because, uh, you know, that market is shrinking here in the States. Uh, but it, you know, we saw the spy shots. I talked about those several months back when they were first spied. Um, and, uh, you know, looks to be similar, but, you know, have some nice improvements. And I do hope they bring it to the States, uh, you know, with the manual and stuff. That would be fun. Um, but, yeah, I think uh, you're going to be seeing the full reveal here in a couple of weeks at the Tokyo Motor Show. I believe that's like the 23rd to the 24th or something like that is when that's coming. Um, so, yeah, keep an eye on that. And I'll be talking about that in a weekly update for sure. Um, we have uh, – Dries uh, says, hey, Matt, just bought a 2011 Mustang GT with slew of mods and low mileage. My first manual car to learn in. I think your bullet got me to love the Stangs. Thanks. I appreciate that. And I'm, I'm glad you're enjoying the car. Um, yeah, that's that's why I do these videos is, you know, I, I truly believe that if everyone can own a car that they enjoy, it doesn't matter if it's expensive or or cheap, you know, if you can find something that you love, something you enjoy driving every day, it makes your life just a little bit better. You know, even if you're going to a job you hate or you're going somewhere you're not looking forward to going to, if you have a fun car, uh, I think that really, really helps. And so I'm glad that the bullet video has kind of guided you towards the Mustang and you enjoy those. Um, congrats on the purchase. Um, other stuff here. Um, we have, uh, my back hurts says, Matt, how much is your water bill a month? I, I don't know. I, that's a very random question. Um, I think it's like 30 bucks or something. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh, Sonic Boom says, if you had to buy an electric car, which one would you buy? Um, if I had to buy an electric car, what would I buy? I think, I don't know. That's a good question. Probably. I really like plug-in hybrids better than full-on EVs personally, because I like that flexibility. If I had to buy an electric car though, probably the new version of the Nissan Leaf, if I were spending my money now. If money were no object, probably a Tesla Model S, um, you know, with the full P100D or whatever, those would probably be what I would go for. But otherwise, I think, you know, the Nissan Leaf is a really nice value for the money, a very nice package. I also really like the Kia Nero EV. That was a uh, pretty solid too for an electric car. And I like how you can change the regenerative braking with the paddles with that. That was kind of fun to, to play around with. Um, 
but we got about eight minutes left and I'll be uh, shutting this down around uh, five o'clock here, my time. Uh, so we'll do a few more questions here. Uh, Omar says, Matt, is the BMW Vision Next 100 the future design of cars? Um, I think it's probably towards the future of what BMW will be like. Um, but as far as the future design of cars, um, you know, I mean, obviously that's a very, um, you know, very futuristic type thing. Like, you know, it has those like weird tires that morph and stuff. It's really hard to say because, you know, if you look at some of those types of vehicles from the 50s that were like, this is what the future is going to be like, flying cars or whatever. And it's always been very off. So it's really hard to, you know, look into the future and, you know, guess at what that's going to be like. So I don't know. It's very hard to say if that's the future design or not. Um, Son of Tamriel says used Fisker Karma for electric car. I think the Fiskers, uh, they're just, there's no dealer network really. Um, there's very little support. I would not be into a Fisker personally. Um, any thoughts on Volkswagen wagons? Uh, they're awesome, <laughs> especially with the diesel. Uh, they're you know, really solid little cars. I actually did a, a Jetta wagon review. I think it was a 2015 or 2016 model. And I actually really liked it. They're nice little cars. It's a shame that they're getting rid of the all track and stuff. Cause you know, that was one of the last manual wagons you could get. And, um, so that's a bummer, but uh, Fatuzzi says thoughts on the Toyota Corolla hatchback. Does it feel underpowered? Uh, I did a full review on the Corolla hatchback, so you can hear all my thoughts there and that, but, uh, I don't think it's underpowered. It could use more power, but for what it is, I think it's a good, you know, mildly sporty, you know, hatchback, uh, kind of, uh, set up there. And I think for a commuter vehicle, it's a nice package for sure. <laughs> Uh, Smile Permal says, have there been any reports for a possible Aston Martin Vantage with the DBS Superleggera's V12 engine? I think that might come later if it does ever come, but I think, you know, that's, they, excuse me, have a very slow rollout with the, excuse me again, with the Aston Martins and their, especially the Vantage, you know, because they got to keep the vehicle going for 10 years or whatever, because they have slower, you know, product rollovers than most companies. Um, so I think there's a possibility, but I haven't heard any reports yet. I think that's kind of, again, premature for that, but I think that will be something that happens eventually, as long as it fits. I'm not sure if it does or not, but uh, if it does, then I think that's probably a safe bet to see eventually. Um, James says, thoughts on the 2003-2004 Ford Mustang Mach 1. They're pretty awesome as long as you don't care about the interior. <laughs> that's that's about it. I did a review on a 2003 Mustang GT, and uh, that was a long time ago. Um, but I was a little, uh, little rough on that interior, and a lot of people really got mad at me in that video for how much I trash-talked that interior. But as long as you don't care about a nice interior, they're great cars. The Mach 1 especially, you got that shaker hood and stuff. Very, very cool. Um we have Chance. He asks, uh, how do you feel about Altezas and IS300s? Um, I actually do have someone that has offered an IS300 for me to review, and I'm very curious to drive it because um, I don't think I've ever driven an IS300. I definitely haven't reviewed one. Um, so I'd definitely like to review one. Hopefully that'll be something I can do here in the next um, you know, year or less and uh, post that review. But uh, they're very solid, reliable vehicles. They're rear-wheel drive. You know, they're very fun in that way, I'm sure. And obviously they make for great drift cars. Lots of people have built them into those. Um, but yeah, I haven't driven one, so I can't really say. Um, someone else says, uh, view, review of a Ford Crown Vic. That's another vehicle that I actually would like to review, but haven't had any offers uh, from anyone yet. But uh, it's definitely a vehicle I'm open to reviewing. Um, other things here. Shoop says, just read that we are looking at 2026 at the earliest for all new Mustang. Does that sound right to you? Also heard it will be on an SUV platform. So uh, the platform I think is a little more credible, you know, cause there's talks that that's really the only rural drive based platform. If they want to go to a new platform, they could pull a Dodge uh, move and just use the same platform and, you know, adapt that to an all new Mustang um, and have everything else be new except for the platform. Um, but as far as the 2026 uh, timeline, I did hear that as well. And I talked about the future Mustang rumors, I think, you know, probably maybe six months ago when that news first broke, I think, but I think from, what I've heard is that there will be another mini refresh in like 2021 or something like that. And then it might be till 2026, but I think Ford's plans are still up in the air about it. Um, cause I heard 2023 and then I went to 2026 that people are like, no, that's too long. It's gonna be 2023. So it's kind of going back and forth. So not sure what to think about the new Mustang just yet and when that's coming. Uh, but I think hopefully it's sooner than that. Cause 
Uh, if, it, if they wait that long, it's going to be a struggle for the Mustang. I do know, you know, they did promise us a hybrid version coming as well. So I think there should be some type of new Mustang variant with that here in the next year or two. And then, you know, we'll have to see if, you know, the EV powertrain from that SUV type thing uh, works its way to the Mustang or, or not. We'll have to see. Um, but yeah, who knows? Um, other stuff here we have, uh, what we have, a uh, Kay's Nino says, what do you think about body swaps? Like putting a 69 challenger body on a 2019 Hellcat or demon frame and powertrain. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of people, I think they just rather resto mod instead. I think that's a little bit less work or a lot less work. Um, as far as body swaps, I mean, I like the idea of that from a style standpoint, but from a safety standpoint, personally, um, I like the safety of new cars and you can't fit modern bumper beams and stuff behind a lot of those old um, shapes and uh, body styles and stuff. So I personally would never be interested in something like that, but it's very cool and it's fun for a SEMA build or something like that. But, um, you know, I personally wouldn't want to drive around a car that, you know, has, not, has you know, like new Hellcat power in, um, you know, something like an old uh, Challenger or something like that. That just would be kind of sketchy, I think. Uh, I mean, if you have the frame and stuff, that would obviously give you the better handling, but that's kind of tough to, to translate to uh, an older vehicle. Um, Omar says, RX-9, when can we expect it? Um, I don't know if that's ever happening. I think Mazda... You know, there's rumors that in Tokyo here in a couple of weeks, they're going to show a new Mazda coupe, possibly that they're working on an inline six. And so it could be a large coupe with an inline six motor, kind of like a Mustang or more so like an RC competitor from, you know, Lexus, something like that, I think is kind of what they might be going for with whatever that is. And so that could be something that, you know, we see, but as far as an RX-9, I don't know if we'll ever see something like that again. We'll have to see. Case Nino, thank you so much for the uh, super chat as well. He says, what do you think about, oh, I just, <laughs> just said that. So I must have missed your super chat, um, but I just answered the question. So hopefully uh, that answer works for you. But um but yeah, other things here. Um, Black Spy and White Spy 42 says, what do you think about the new RAV4? I did a review on the new RAV4, so you can hear all my thoughts on it in that video. I even drove the hybrid one a little bit as well, so you can hear all my thoughts in that review video. Um, Zachary says, thoughts on the Chevy Equinox, because uh, they're everywhere, and every time I go out of town for the weekend, I see these everywhere on the highway. It's a very popular crossover. And, um, so I think that's why, you know, a lot of people get them. Um, I have not driven an Equinox, uh, but I do know that it's a very, very strong market and you have the brand new RAV4, which is uh, really good. You have the new CRV and, uh, the Forester, all these uh, vehicles are very new. So a little fresher than the Equinox. So I think the Equinox is definitely due for a refresh, which is coming soon, I think, but yeah, I think GM, you know, some of their stuff is a little bit behind the times in some ways. It could be a little bit better. Um, we have two, uh, it's five o'clock here. <clears throat> so I'll do one more question. Sonic Boom says, uh, who made your neon sign in the background? And that uh, credit goes to my friend Jason, who actually made that himself. I think um, him and his dad have like a 3D printer and, and or something like that. And they were able to... Uh, to do that. And it's, it's very cool. I love it. And I actually have it the right way this time because last live stream, I had it backwards and I thought that the camera inverted it, but it didn't. And so, yeah, I think it's a really cool sign and uh, I'll keep using it in future live streams, but hopefully you guys enjoy this live stream. Unfortunately, I do have to go here. Um, but thank you guys very much for watching and let me know in the comments of this video, whether you'd like to see me do another one of these, I can start doing these about once a month. If you guys, you know, enjoy them and, you know, want to keep doing them here. So let me know what you think about that. But thank you guys very much for watching. Stay tuned for the awesome review of the Charger Hellcat wide body coming on Wednesday. And uh, thanks for joining me here on this live stream. Thank you to everyone, especially that did the super chats. It's very generous of you. Thank you so much. And uh, have a good rest of your weekend and a good week, everyone. Take care.